legal, personnel, student-related matters, HIV reports, negotiations, and other confidential matters. And be it further resolved that these matters will be made public when the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Uh, can I have a motion? I think I'll second. second. I will second for thank you. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Can I have everyone's attention, please? Good evening. Uh, welcome. We are thankful that everyone is here. It's a, a nice uh, crowd of folks. Um, we're going to start. Um, we did this early, but now that everyone is here, we want to say the pledge again and have a moment of silence. Zeno, will you uh, do a roll call for us? Mr. Coleman? Here. Mr. Nolly? Here. Mr. Goodman? Here. Mr. Singh? Here. Mr. Oates? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Mr. Velez? Mr. James Vickery? Here. We're working that out. Give us just a few minutes and they'll, and they'll start circulating. And then, okay. So, then, um, Mr. Sanchez, I'll turn it over to you to do some introductions and welcome. That's great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our annual joint board meeting. Tonight we get together with our neighbors from our sending districts to highlight some of the special programs and offerings at Hackensack High School. Um, before I introduce Principal Montesano and his administrative team to you, Please join me in welcoming our guests from our sending districts. Please welcome Superintendent of Schools from Rochelle Park, Dr. Sue DeMilbley, and board members uh, Teresa Cavallo and Christina Holtz. <laughs> the Superintendent of uh, South Hackensack, uh, Mr. Jason Chicarella, uh, Chicar Chicarcella, I can't say him, so I apologize, uh, sends his regrets. And finally, the Superintendent of Maywood, um, Mike Jordan, and also for Maywood Board President Kevin Taylor. We thank them for taking time from their busy schedules to join us tonight. Please give them all a round of applause. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming Principal Montesano and his amazing team. Take it away, it's good. <laughs> there are more seats, four seats available if you have anyone would like them. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Montesano. I'm the principal of Hackensack High School. I'd just like to thank our own Board of Education and our administrators for having us tonight, so thank you. I'd also like to welcome the members of the Rochelle Park, Maywood, and South Hackensack Administration and Board of Education. Um, this really is always one of my favorite nights. It's an opportunity for us to highlight all the wonderful things that happen at Hackensack High School. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to choose a particular area, but this year, one kind of popped into my head. Uh, sometimes we kind of rack our brains to feel what we can do and what we can highlight something different. This one, to be honest with you, was very, very easy. Tonight, uh, we're going to highlight our world language department. And I think after you see our students present tonight and all of our wonderful teachers that are here, it's really a no-brainer. They do a wonderful job. They bring a tremendous amount of culture, climate, and spirit into our building. Uh, and also outside of our building, too. They represent us so well every single day, and I think you're, it's going to be pretty clear as to why they were chosen tonight. Um, thank you. Just some formal introductions. I'd like to introduce Ms. Patty Lozano, our grade 12 assistant principal. Nicole Adams, grade 11. Bob Greenwood, grade 10. It, he has some ECDC fans. It's impressive. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Celso King, grade 9. And our interim athletic director, Mr. Gordon Whiting. Additionally, we're very fortunate to have some wonderful supervisors that help us kind of really make the wheels go, so to speak. Uh, Roseanne Cavallo, English. Rich Del Vecchio, Science and Industrial Arts. Talino Sepian, Guidance. Joanne Winter Special Services, and the brain trust of our World Language Department, Ms. Mary Almasina. So tonight what we would like to do, we have three offerings of world languages at the high school. We have Spanish, French, and Italian. They each offer so much for our students. There are different pathways that our students can take, and it really is a wonderful opportunity. Additionally, I'd like to share some of the world language data, um, AP data, excuse me, that they have this year, and I think it really does, it is going to speak for itself. Um, probably the most impressive thing to me is I asked the world language department, I said, can I meet you guys one day after school? We could talk about possibly highlighting some of your different, you know, initiatives and activities. Every single one of them said yes. Every single one of them met me after school for as long as it took to kind of get things done. And not only that, they met me here tonight at 6 o'clock with 65 of their closest friends, students, um, and they rehearsed, they went over things. They really are a wonderful group. So I'd like to just put a face to, or name to the face, so to speak, for some of our different um, teachers who are here tonight. Some of our Spanish teachers, Ed Giovanni Colosino, <laughs> Soraya Gonzalez, <laughs> Johanny Guillon, Mercedes Hernandez, Luisa Manzor, Elsa Marquez Aponte, Stephanie Moreno, and Giovanni Soto. Additionally, we have two Italian teachers at the high school, Ms. Marianne Russo and Ms. Cariella Tejada. And we have a French teacher who has brought so much life into that department, in particular, Claudia Geddes. So, one of the things that happened, I guess, due to the pandemic, but across the entire country, AP data plummeted. You know, and if you think about it, due to the pandemic, due to the, you know, virtual learning, it went tremendously down. The only place it didn't go down was in the world language department, which kind of jumped out to me, said, we need to recognize this group of teachers. We need to highlight some of the different work that they do. But if you look at historical data over the past couple of years, if you think about New Jersey's educational system, it is very high compared to the rest of the country. Not only do our AP teachers exceed United States uh, you know, benchmarks, they also exceed New Jersey averages as well, which to me is a tremendous, tremendous testament to the people who are sitting before you tonight. Uh, Spanish language and culture is always tremendously high, but a good benchmark for college readiness is having a hundred, uh, getting a three on your AP exam. A hundred percent of those students got a three or better in world language, which, I mean, in Spanish language, was tremendous. Our French language and culture, which is new to us, but we really are building a true program. Um, the, the course average was three, but every single student got a three or higher. So 100% of those students as well. 
an Italian language and culture, which again, the, the sky is the limit. They're doing a wonderful job there now that we have additional offerings in the middle school. But 100% um, of their students got a three or higher as well. So we really are so proud of their work. So tonight, no one wants to hear me talk anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to the best commodity and the best asset that Hackensack High School has to offer, and that's our students. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our students who are going to speak about our Spanish program. Buenos noches y bienvenidos a todos. My name is Nala James. I'm one of the many students at Hackensack High School taking a Spanish course. I'm currently enrolled in Spanish 3. And throughout my Spanish studies, I have loved learning the diversity of Spanish language and culture. I especially enjoyed the interactive activities that teachers have used and allowed me to have a great experience. There's something beautiful about learning someone else's culture and I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I have with my teachers every day. Hi, my name is Teacher Andrews and I'm currently enrolled in the Honors 3 Spanish course here at Hackensack High School. I'm very excited about the challenge that this course brings and the prospect of broadening my language spectrum. It exposes me to a lot of culture, reading, spelling, writing, and grammar. And I'm excited to continue learning more about the language and Spanish studies overall. Most importantly, though, I'm enjoying the class. Ms. Colosino, she's a great she's a great teacher, and just the attitude she comes into school with every day pushes me to want to learn more about the Spanish language. I understand the importance of learning Spanish, especially in today's climate. And the Honor Spanish Three class I'm taking pushes me to find full comprehension at all. And I'm really happy to be one of her students. Thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Brandon Sarango, and I'm here to talk about the AP Spanish course here in Hackensack High School. I come from a Spanish household, and obviously my first language was Span indeed Spanish, and I've been taking Spanish class since the fifth grade back in South Hackensack Elementary School. So when I first came here to Hackensack as a freshman, I took Native 1, as a sophomore, I took Native 2, and as a junior, Native 3, and as of now, I am currently taking AP Spanish. And my goal for this class and what it has to offer is the bilingual seal at the end of the year that we receive once you pass the AP exam. And also it helps you with your, uh, your Spanish literacy and helps you improve to be able to speak Spanish fluently. Also the bilingual seal I would like to talk about, it helps, um, it helps you get ready for college and for job applications when the time comes. I strongly believe that it is important to be bilingual and be able to speak two different languages here in the United States. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Kimberly Gomez and I am one of the students that are appeared for AP Spanish. Um, I came from Maywood Middle School where um, the majority of my Spanish years kind of revolved around uh, worksheets and packets, uh, talking about Latin America and Hispanic culture in English texts, um, paired with also like grammatical lessons, which didn't really uh, challenge me as a Spanish speaking person. In eighth grade, um, before I graduated, they allowed us to take a placement text, test, which uh, would help us on our upcoming freshman year of high school. And that one allowed me to begin my freshman year in native Spanish too. And from that point on, I am a junior now, uh, having uh, taking uh, AP Spanish at the moment. And to complete, to be completely honest, when I started, I didn't have like a lot of high expectations as I didn't know what the course might bring. But to my surprise, um, the course was actually like, it's really interesting and thoroughly informative, but it also worked on many things that I need to fix in my writing as an American. And so far, this class has allowed me to be able to work on my Spanish writing skills and reading comprehension in addition of learning being able, 
of of learning and being able to finally implement more concise and complex words in my into my writing. I finally uh, feel like I'm improving doing justice to my language and including what my peers said. Uh, these also help us uh, kind of obtain university credits after we graduate and also with the bilingual diploma we kind of have more of an open path and opportunities when uh, we decide what to do with our future. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Janina Huarquila. Growing up, I lived in a Spanish-speaking household. All my life, I've been a translator for my parents who used to struggle with understanding English. At the age of 35, my dad wanted to learn proper English to communicate better with people and his own kids. We lived in a country where the English language is a necessity, but for a person with a little education background, this language barrier makes, makes life rockier. There are things in the English language that my dad could still not read or understand properly, and of course, neither did a six-year-old daughter. But I was in a school that was taught in English, so I had to know every word in the dictionary and translate it to Spanish, according to my dad. I'm sorry. Every time my dad spoke in Spanish, I would respond in Spanish. But as I grew older, I was surrounded by the English language and only responded in English. As I kept getting accustomed to speaking English, I started to lose my ability to speak Spanish. Becoming embarrassed to speak Spanish, I enrolled in a class that was taught and spoken in Spanish only. I entered Ms. Hernandez's class my sophomore year for the first time, pre AP Native Spanish 1. Sorry, 2. Little did I know the journey that was ahead of me. This class has challenged me in the best way possible. This AP Spanish class has taught me about values and morals many people do not recognize nowadays, while also teaching me about the correct usage of grammar and spelling. An assignment in this class is to create a research paper. It would be about things such as social media, the usage of iPhones, or even plastic surgery. These papers would be opinion-based and always filled my brain with excitement. Some of my best research papers were written in this Spanish class because of the preparation and guidance the students and I had. We were taught how to properly observe and analyze the resources we had in front of us to make a beautiful paper that exercised our mind to think deeper than the surface level, while also learning a valuable, valuable lesson. <sighs> These engaging lessons prepared us for real life experiences, and it also prepared us for the upcoming AP test. The, Sp the language teachers have given me and all their students the opportunity to become successful Spanish speaking students and the best chance out of five on the AP test. The Spanish AP test has had a positive and powerful impact on the students and I. We were challenged, motivated, and disciplined. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'd now like to call up our French students to speak about the French program. The MC. <laughs> Bonsoir, bienvenue à tous. Je m'appelle Billy Fazlov. J'étudie la langue française, et français, et je suis le président de la Société en arrière de français de l'école. Now, for those of you who really understand me, you should take French. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All I said, all I said, <laughs> all I said was good evening and welcome to everyone. My name is Billy Fosloff and I'm a P French student. And as well as I'm current president of French Honor Society at my high school. Tonight, uh, me and my classmate will be uh, presenting you uh, about the courses that are offered at our Hackensack High School. So here we have French Level 1, and we have French Level 2, French 2 Honors, French 3, French 3 Honors, and AP French Language and Culture. So uh, we, me, um, together, uh, we, we, we have here some students from different levels of French classes that are going to share about their experiences uh, in the French class. So we have French Level 1, Salut, bonsoir. Hello, I'm Christina. And I'm Victoria. And we are French 1 students. We just, we just started exploring this beautiful language and so far so good. We are loving our class and the diversity of our culture. Did you know that French is an official language in 29 countries? Yep, we recently learned that in class. We are looking forward to learning more throughout the year and moving on to the next level. Merci. 
Merci, mes amis. And we have French level two, William. Hello. Hello, my name is William, and I'm in French too. We, uh, I love of learning about and hearing the French language and, and learning the culture from all the assignments we do. Merci beaucoup. And we have French honors too. Bonjour, I'm Michelle. And I'm Erica. And we're taking French two honors and we are very excited about this class and the challenges it presents. Although French, the French language language is not as easy as it sounds, it's still very beautiful. In French Honors 2, we are learning more about the culture and more how to communicate in French. We are looking forward to learning more and advancing onto different types of skills. Merci. Merci beaucoup, mes amis. And we have French Level 3. Salut, my name is Rokia. My name is Edward. And we are currently French 3 Honors students. As you advance in the level of French, the classes can become more challenging, but it's always as fun as being in level 1. In all French classes, we learn about the diversity of French-speaking countries and their unique cultures. My classmates and I are excited to learn more about the French language. I am planning on taking French all four years of my high school career. Merci. Thank you. Now we have AP French student. Salut tout le monde, je m'appelle Genesis and I am a current AP French student. Um, in our class, we communicate mainly in French and continue exploring the French language and culture through the analysis of current events and reading of authentic materials, journals, and music to help us prepare for the AP exam that will take place in May. Uh, we hope this helps you to um it will help you to give you a general idea of French courses that are offered at our high school on our daily basis. In addition to the French courses, many of us also participate in the French club and attend French Honor Society meetings. And we have a lot of exciting ideas and events prepared for the near future. So what is the goal of the French club? Can you, yeah, sorry, okay. Uh, okay. So the French club mission is uh, we continuously look into extracurricular activities that allow for awareness of French language and Francophone culture into the school community. Of course, we encourage everyone to join the club, even if you do not take French. Thank you. So the mission, the goal of the French Honor Society at Hackensack High School is to recognize students who have achieved excellence in the study of the French and promotes a greater understanding and appreciation of the Francophone culture and civilization. We are looking for also we are looking forward to our to our, our sashes in our graduation ceremony and our um, course proudly. Also during our French club and French Honor Society meetings, we do uh, school activities. In this picture we have French cooking class. And the next slide we have eighth grade orientation. And also in our every meetings, in our every French club and French society meetings, uh, we keep exploring about the culture of the friends and uh, Francophone of the culture. And also we have in this slide holiday gift exchange. And this was a recent uh, picture uh, took over with our group. Um, this was our first official meeting, first official meeting of French Club and French Honor Society, which we named Back to School Mid and Great. Some student opportunities that we've had in the past was the French trip to Madeleine's Petit Paris, where students got to enjoy a delicious, typical French meal. We've also, we also hosted a community service, which there was a food drive to the Hackensack Community Center. And we also had the slam dunk, the junk, cleaning the parks of our community, which we will also have uh, October 30th, this October 30th. 
And that was it. Thank you. Au revoir. And uh, and finalement, and finally, we would like to thank you all for your time today and for your continued support. If you would like to know more about our French club, French club, please uh, support and follow on our Instagram hhs French. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. I'd now like to welcome our Italian students to call up uh, to discuss our Italian classes. Buonasera, mi chiamo Derek Cusco. Io sono in la classe, Itali in la classe avanzata di italiano. So to start things off, I want to discuss about the Italian courses that we offer here in Hackensack. So something amazing that I find is that Italian is now being offered in 7th grade compared to it only being offered during 8th grade during my middle school days. The reason why I find that amazing is because students who choose to take Italian from 7th grade to, it from seventh grade to 8th grade will have 2 years of experience if they choose to tackle on Italian during their high school years. Okay, so to start off with our Italian courses, students, all our, all our Italian courses offer five credits. So students who choose to take Italian in the high school will start off with Italian one. Upon the completion of that class, students will take Italian two or honors Italian two with a teacher's recommendation. Upon the completion of that class, students will take Italian three or honors Italian three with a teacher's recommendation. Last but not least, the class that I'm currently enrolled in, AP Italian Language and Culture, students will take that as their final year, junior year, or senior year. <laughs> so something amazing about this class is that if you choose to take the AP exam, and of course pass it, you will receive college credits. And something that I took note of is that last year's AP Italian class, all the students passed their AP exam. So my class is now currently looking to replicate those scores. Thank you, and I will now present my friend, Angelo. Buon oggi tutti. Mi chiamo Angelo Valencia. E in attuale sto prendendo le classi dell'italiano AP. The Italian course and curriculum can is really no different uh, from other curriculum classes offered by Hackensack High School, whether it be from Spanish or French. The Italian course and curriculum is divided into two core values. The first one, I would like to reckon believe, is the Italian language itself. You will be learning as a student, whether you be from Italian 1 to AP Italian, everything about syntax, diction, and of course, everything grammatical regarding Italian. However, though, as importantly, the second core value of every Italian, Italian learner is itself the Italian culture. When it comes to the Italian on society, it is the most highest regard. It's the highlight of every Italian student who is attending Hackensack High School. When it comes to the Italian on society, I would reckon that it's going to be divided into three core parts. The first core part is, of course, the Italian language. The second core part is the Italian culture. And finally, arguably the most important in Hackensack is the community service. As you are a junior, typically in your junior year, most likely during your spring, that is when the Italian Honor Society induction begins. Now, of course, there will always be some sort of prerequisites. Namely, there are three of them. As we stated, uh, as we stated over there, the first prerequisite is taking three full classes of Italian. The second course, oh, excuse me, the second prerequisite is those three Italian courses, you must have a passing grade, namely an A. And finally, the last prere prerequisite is completing 15 hours of community service in, uh, in Hackensack High School in school service. And now, excuse me for a little bit, I'm going to read out the mission goal statement it per verbatim. The Italian Honor Society's goal is to recognize students who have achieved excellence in the study of Italian, as well as to promote a greater understanding and appreciation of the Italian culture and civilization. Which by itself pretty interesting, no? <laughs> 
Now, of course, there is a video that we're going to be playing to you all, which is about the Italian artist induction. And now this happened, of course, before, like, you know, all of the chaos that happened in, like, two years. And, of course, this video is about our oath. Now, please, go ahead. <laughs> nella nostra Costituzione. Tramite il nostro esempio speriamo di incoraggiare e diffondere interessi nella lingua e cultura italiana. Questo lo promettiamo. Now, in terms of the Italian honor society, we already know that it cultivates new, <laughs> new knowledge of Italian culture of it all. And so, I, with, the Italian, uh, with the Italian honor society in mind, that's what I, I believe. This honor society truly makes Italian culture molto bellissimo. Now, I'm going to present David, who will talk about the Italian club. Grazie Angelo. Uh, buonasera, mi chiamo Davide Valarezzo e io sto prendendo italiano nel Hackensack High School. For those of you who do not speak Italian, good evening. My name is David Valarezzo and I'm currently taking AP Italian at the Hackensack High School. I'd like to take the time tonight to introduce you all to Circolo Italiano, our high school's very own Italian club. Circolo Italiano is involved in many activities throughout the year, one of which is high school orientation where we give a school tour to the incoming freshmen. We also participate in Slam, junk the, Slam Dunk the Junk every year, an event where we dedicate a day to cleaning up our community. In addition, we also devote a fundraiser to an important cause every year. This year, that exact cause is Purses for a Purpose, where we will be donating essentials to victims of domestic abuse. Overall, Tricolo Italiano's main agenda is to promote the Italian heritage by serving our community. And most importantly, anyone can join, regardless of whether they've taken the Italian course or not. Grazie. Thank you for your time. Finally, we have two student organizations that really, again, when you talk about community service, they go well above and beyond, and they really do align to the mission and vision of Hackensack High School. So first, I'd like to call up our Latin American Student Association. Um, good, ev good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Reynoso, a member of LASA, Stanford Latin American Student Association. Um, LASA is an or organization open to all the students at the high school that will expose them to the culture traditions of Latin America. It was founded in September of 2013 with, with a membership of over 40 students that has organized a number of activities. Some of those are ESL student tutoring, slam dunk, a, a love me presentation, carnival dance, bake sales and holiday gift exchange. Muy buenas noches con todos. Me llamo Ivana Gurumendi y también soy miembro del Club de Laza. Uh, some community activities that we do. Okay, some school activities. We have the Hispanic Heritage Month celebration where some students and club members participate dancing, singing, and presenting poems. We are part of the incoming eighth grade orientation where we talk to the incoming students. That's not the one. Not that one. Yep, that one. So the incoming students and let them know what we do here at the high school. Uh, we also do the flower grams um, to recollect money for our association. We also do the back to school night bilingual guides where we talk to the um, parents that don't speak English. Um, some student opportunities that lots of members get is go uh, like on trips to Ron Paul College. We get to tour 
the college and to see how how it is to pretty much to feel at col uh, at a college. And then we also get to see like let us know how the paperwork is pretty much. And also we also go we get to go to on a trip to Montclair State and we here at the Hackathon High School we get to see the alumni presentation where former students here come in pretty much get gifts of their their experience here at the Hackathon High School where um pretty much with advice and pretty much to take any opportunity we can get here to succeed here at Hackathon High School. Uh, some community activities that we do, uh, we do collaboration with parents outreach program. We also do readings to children or parents in the ELSO evening classes and LASA also gives scholarships to seniors. Muchas gracias por estar aquí y que tengan una buena noche. And last, but certainly not least, is our Spanish Honor Society. All 56 of them. Now, I'm not going to do this because you guys did this much better than me, so I'll just stand in the back. Right. Buenas noches a todos. My name is Krisha Gandhi and I'm a senior here at Hackensack High School and I'm the president of the Spanish National Honor Society. I am here today along with the other Spanish National Honor Society officers as well as our advisor, Senora Colosino, over there. Um, so our mission as the Spanish National Honor Society is to promote academic excellence and the interest of the Spanish language and to feed the need for education, to strive to make a difference, to express the importance of getting involved and to benefit domestic and international communities through a variety of service opportunities. At Hackensack High School, we accomplish this mission through a variety of activities and events. In this presentation, we are going to show you what we've done. Throughout the years, we've done so many projects that benefited Hackensack High School students, Hackensack's community, the state, and international communities. So in this next few slides, we're going to discuss um, local uh, things that we've done and community service. So here in the city of Hackensack, we have something called the Slam Dunk the Junk, which throughout the city of Hackensack, we uh, help clean up the city. And we normally do this in the fall and in the spring. Another thing that we do is the Prospect, um, Prospect Heights Care Center and help out um, the senior citizens during the holidays and in the spring. Typically we do things like play games, plant the yard, sing Christmas carols, give gifts and spread holiday cheer. Another thing that we do is the uh, Greater Bergen Community, which we donate gifts to children in need. Hola, soy Ashley Zhang, and I'm one of the vice presidents of the Spanish National Honor Society. Um, while we are serving our local community, we're also helping international communities around the world. We have worked with many countries such as Puerto Rico, Colombia, Mexico, and Dominican Republic. Currently, we're focusing on working with the village of Peru. Last year as a group, we were able to donate $1,000 as Krisha won second place in the Team SA contest. And team donated $500 to help Peru in our schools we have. In total, we were able to donate $1,500 to help a small village in Peru to grow quinoa crops. Team is an empathic entrepreneur equality mission, a nonprofit organization designed to promote empathy, equality, entrepreneurialism, and diversity. We empower youth development through education and food programs, support women entrepreneurs who want to help their community and help help poor communities. In 2018, we have attended many workshops through Team where we met many high school students and leaders around the world to learn about different ways to help underprivileged communities. Serving our local and international community has brought our team together immensely as we work together to accomplish a common goal. Muchas gracias. Hola, me llamo Trisha Gandhi and I'm one of the vice presidents of the Spanish National Honor Society. 
Through a variety of fundraisers, we collect money for Senior Scholarship Night and other Spanish National Honor Society's activities. During the pandemic, we had a poster contest to lift the spirits and stay positive. One of our Hackensack High School student, Alina Mo Moya, was the winner of the contest. During the 8th grade orientation, we like to showcase what the Spanish Honor Society is all about to recruit new members for following years and keep the club going strong. We also do a lot of student activities. Every year we celebrate the Hispanic Heritage Month with performances, but this year we did a door decoration competition. We always participate with perf per performances for the Black History Month where we bring African Hispanic culture live to the Hackensack High School stage. Our annual futsal tournament is an indoor soccer competition where students and teachers create their teams to compete in the main gym. We have gold, silver, and bronze medals for the winning teams. The whole school gets involved and celebrates the society. Gracias. We have a variety of fundraisers to support our endeavors. To name a few, a car wash. In November, we'll host our annual futsal tournament. The plans are participations in the 5K for team against the Bergen County Schools to see who gets the most participants. The induction for incoming members will take place in April. There will also be a teacher talent show in May and we hope you consider it attending this event to see many of our teachers showcase their talents. Muchas gracias. We thank you for your continued support. Well, that concludes our program. I think, as you could see, it really was a no-brainer, kind of, uh, you know, selecting our world language department. To our staff, our teachers, thank you. You guys really are wonderful. And an even bigger round of applause to our best asset, and that's our students. So thank you guys very much for presenting tonight. Mr. Sanchez, thank you. Thank you, Principal Montesano, and then all of our wonderful students and staff for bringing this, bringing this program to us and this excellent presentation. Um, I would be remiss if I did not mention that our Vice President of South Hackensack is here, of uh, Annika Davis. I apologize, I did not realize you were here. Um, South Hackensack is actually having their board meeting tonight, so thank you, Annika Davis, for joining us tonight. Okay, next up, um, we're pleased to announce that all of our Hackensack Public Schools have achieved Sustainable Jerseys for Schools Bronze Level Certification, um, with four schools also submitting for and earning Digital School Stars recognition. It should be known that our four, excuse me, that our four Digital School Stars recipients are among only 37 schools in the entire state to receive this distinction. With well over 2,000 students in the schools in the state, this is quite an accomplishment and they have a lot to be proud of. Um, please observe this uh, one-minute video. Super. I'm Robert Sanchez, superintendent of Hackensack Public Schools. Today, I'm proud to announce that all of our schools have been awarded with bronze medal status for the Sustainable Jerseys in Schools program. Here is our electric green machine that's helping us towards our efforts towards sustainability. <laughs> We are extremely honored to accept this. We know that sustainability is something that is ongoing, and we are continuing to make sure that that happens. We're already putting in an effort this year for everything from environmentalism to equity. Thanks to our staff.
inspire everyone on Christmas to bring the Charles Prince of Jackson Avenue School. We are excited to receive the Jersey Schools for Sustainability and Digital Stars Award. Go Jackson! <laughs> Thank you. We are proud of each school's commitment to sustainability and digital learning, and we thank each of the schools for their respect and their respective green teams for their leadership in achieving this distinguished honor. I would also be remiss if I did not acknowledge Adrian Sapero, District Technology Coordinator, for his leadership and with this initiative, as we would not have been successful without him. So thank you, Adrian. Um, quick public service announcement, if you own a Jeep, license plate number X37LPV, you left your lights on. A Jeep, license plate number X37LPV, by the way, that's not mine, uh, you left your lights on. Um, Vice President Scott James Hickory, can you please join me in the corner there? We're going to present the schools with their awards. Okay, thank you all for your commitment to sustainability and digital learning. At this point in time, we'll take a five minute recess for um, any member of the public that only came for the high school presentation. Um,
take five minutes. Other than that, we'll continue with the meeting. Thank you. Question of um, our meeting. Hey, yeah. go, listen up, everybody. We got to start. So I'm going to um, welcome back to our next portion. Uh, I'll introduce now Andrea Parchment, who is um, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction and our Affirmative Action, our, um, Affirmative Action Officer. Uh, she is going to give our reports on district student performance data and then school safety and data system for the end of uh, last school year, 20, uh, 2021. Good evening, everyone. Today, tonight, I'm going to present to you uh, the results of our student performance data from the district's access testing. Um, access is an assessment uh, that we provide to measure how well our English language learners are acquiring the English language as they are on their way to being bilingual or trilingual. The first slide and the following two slides just pretty much shows you the average scale score and the average proficiency score for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. It also shows you, if you look in the last column, it also shows you the students who are eligible to exit. These students have reached at least a 4.5 to exit. So you have the grade level, you see the number of students tested, the scale score, and the proficiency level. But this is the average for each of these grades. And if you flip to the next, you see the same information for grades six through eight. And then next, grades nine through 12. And this slide is similar to the previous three slides that you saw, except now you see in grades two and three, grades four to five, grades six through eight, and nine through 12, they actually take the same test, but the level of expectation for students to perform is higher. And the next slide is just a total. Now this slide shows the six levels in which students can fall based on their scores. It also shows across five years these results. So for example, if you look at the school year 2016-2017, we had 478 students tested. And if you look, it tells you the percent of students who are entering. And let me explain what entering means. Entering is a student is at a level of sophistication with the language that 
the student hasn't acquired enough language maybe to speak in a complete sentence. So as you go along, the student is emerging, may be able now to uh, speak in phrases. And as you go along, it's developing and it just becomes more sophisticated to the point where the student is writing, reading fluently, able to explain the language and the content areas that they are studying. And so as you can see, if you look across the board, we had 29% entering in 2017, 2016-2017, 2017, 23% emerging, 33% developing, 14% expanding and this is where we want our students and this is not to say what if students are low or high this again is showing how our students are re are acquiring the English language because they are English language learners now I want you to notice that in 2019 2020 we only had 318 uh, take the test that is because in March 2020 we all went home, it was COVID, so they, we weren't able to test. But fortunately, we were able to test students in K through five, K through four, before that time. So just take a minute to just look. And then now, last year, oh, I'm back, if that's all right. Now, the last year, it's 2021, which we are reporting, 580 students, 22% entering, 25% emerging, 31% developing, 20% expanding, 2% bridging, and 0% uh, reaching a level six. And finally, the last slide really shows you specifically the areas and how our students have performed in each area. And if you look at listening, what I want to note is if you look at listening, look at the level six. We had 212 students performing at a level six. We want our students to at least be at level four, five, or six. So if you add up, we have about 58% of students scoring a four or better. And you have to also know these are not always the same students because students exit, new students come into the program. But the important thing is that they are acquiring the language. If you look at speaking, reading, and writing, so when you look at data, you want to see the areas where there can be enhancement. What can we do? Only 13% of our students in speaking, reading, speaking and reading met a level four or above. So we know that's the area that we need to focus on, as well as writing. And our bilingual students will tell us, you can speak, you can read, but when you can really write in another language, it's really, really good. So now what we have to do is have some strategies to improve that area. So I am going to have Marielle Messina. She is the, the director of bilingual, world language, and ESL. And she's just going to share a slide with you to just explain some of the things that we are going to do to address the speaking, the reading, and the writing. So go back. Thank you, Ms. Parchment. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, the next slide will show us some of the action steps that the district has taken and strategies um, to help to help um, our students and staff with targeting some of the deficiency we have noticed with the access to the A little more? Yeah. All 
right, so the first action step that we have taken is that the D data leadership team comprised of district um, administrators has met to review the data and has served as liaisons for staff. In addition, we have scheduling improvements that were completed for clustered groups of L's in each of the six L elementary, middle, and high school. There has also been improved coordination of bilingual ESL program continuum through meetings and shared protocols. Data from the WIDA assessments has also been analyzed by staff members and they have determined the most critical aspects of instructional focus. There have been plenty of opportunities to, for students to further develop and practice their speaking skills in class. In addition, we have the Parent Academy, which will be providing parents with information and resources to support their child's English language learning. Professional development and implementation of Jennifer Servalo's reading and writing strategies in grades K-5 has been ongoing. Utilizing student data to develop targeted lessons in the areas of speaking, reading, and writing for small group instruction has been occurring as well. And finally, um, our elementary school um, teachers have been utilizing reading and writing with English learners by Valentina Gonzalez and Melinda Miller. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I just want to note, this area, it, it, it sounds like just a sentence, but this is a lot of work. And our bilingual teachers, ESL teachers, they really um, have to provide instruction, not only with acquiring the language, but also teaching the content at the same time. So it really takes a lot. So I'd like to just, for us to give a round of applause to our bilingual teachers, all of our teachers. This is another assessment that our students take. Okay. This is another assessment that our students take. It's DLM, Dynamic Learning Maps. And this is taken by a small population of our students with special needs. Our students are tested in language arts and math and science. And this slide gives you an overview of the results. So we have 44% emerging in language arts, 44% approaching, 12% at target. And math, 45% emerging, 33% approaching, and 11% at target. And in science, and I just want to note, science, it was the new test, uh, a very difficult test. So we will be addressing that with students in their specialized programs, IEPs. Now this slide just breaks the results down by grade level. K through five, 50% emerging. 33% approaching, 17% at target. Six through eight, 33% emerging, 67% approaching the target. And we had no students, nine through 12. And this is the same for math, K through five, 33% approaching, 50%, a 33% uh, emerging, excuse me, a 50% approaching target, 17% at target. And six through eight, we have 67% emerging, but we have 33% advanced in math.
And as I stated before, for science, 100% emerging. And we know we have work to do um, in that area. And again, this is a small population of students, but an important population of students. Thank you, Andrea, for that great presentation. I know you have one other. This is our student safety data system report. So what is SSDS? You can see this is the student safety data system, and we refer to it as SSDS. It's used to fulfill state and federal reporting requirements, meaning we must re report all incidents to the state. Incidents of violence, vandalism, harassment, intimidation or bullying, weapons offenses, substance offenses, and any other incidents leading to student removal from our district's six schools. This is collected and it's reported to the state, as well as all HIV trainings and programs and other information are collected and reported to the state. We have two reporting periods. The SSDS reporting years from September 1st through June 30th. However, we have two reporting periods. We report a mid-year report from September 1st through December 31st. So you'll see me back up here again, probably in February for this year. But now I'm reporting the end of the year from 2020-2021. And this is the end of year report. And so what is reported? Incidents that meet the incident type. Definitions will be on the next slide, the next two slides. Incidents that occur on school grounds while school is in session, including arrival and dismissal, and at school-sponsored functions. Incidents of harassment, intimidation, and bullying that occur off school grounds as well. So these are, you can read this, see this for yourself. These are all the incidents that must be reported. Okay. And so here is a result of the incident in 2020, 2021. And Hackensack High School, you can see the number of incidents reported. It could be violence, vandalism, substances, weapons, HIV. It could be any of those. We had two. Nellie K. Parker, two. Fairmount, Fannie Hillers, and Jackson, zero. Middle school, four. Other incidents leading to removal. Okay. Zero, except uh, the middle school, we had seven. And then HIV alleged, meaning it was alleged HIV, two at the high school, one at Nellie K. Parker, zero at Fairmount, four Fannie Maya Hillers, two at Jackson, 14 middle school. HIV trainings. This is where there are trainings conducted throughout the year. There was one at Hackensack High School. And I need to note why there was one at Hackensack High School. But Hackensack High School has uh, started restorative practices. So they do a lot more. That might not fall under here, but they've done a lot with restorative practices, uh, which you'll see when we get to the next page. HIV programs one, HIV trainings, Nellie K. Parker, 11. HIV program seven, Fairmount 12 trainings, five programs, Fannie Meyer Hillis, five trainings, four programs, Jackson, one training, two programs, middle school, 13 trainings, wonderful, and nine programs. And I do need to mention and just give um, just some accolades to our anti-bullying specialist from last year. This was all during COVID. So this was done virtually. And, and just think about all the other things that had to be done. We still gave attention to this because it's important. And then district-wide trainings, that's when our 
anti-bullying specialist or our lead person provides training for uh, the anti-bullying specialist. So here we go again. It's, what's the sense of having data if we're not going to address it? So all of these things we have been doing, but at the top, restorative practices in every district school. Remember the board resolution where we committed to restorative practice? And I will tell you, all of our schools are implementing it at different levels, but the high school is in year three, and it's, they're doing a fantastic job with that. I think that deserves a round of applause for the high school. And then as well as our elementary schools, all the assistant principals, as well as the, the guidance supervisor, work closely together because we're committed to this. And then we have trainings for all district anti-bullying specialists and administrators. We're provided this year each school's climate and culture committee under the leadership of a building administrator meets to review da data and trends in order to create an action plan to improve. And we have teachers who serve on this committee and they contribute well to this. The district's anti-bullying coordinator meets with the district's anti-bullying specialist to review HIV data, to identify ways to improve and address problem areas. Uh, and that would be Heather Coleman, and, and she, she is really fantastic in providing these, these trainings, and she often reminds me of things that need to be done, so I, I just want to uh, acknowledge her for that. And then our central office administration provides support to schools by offering professional development opportunities to enhance culture and climate in the school. So when we say we're committed, um, we put our money where our mouth is toward restorative practices. Uh, we have other uh, professional development that we send teachers and administrators to. So we're happy about that, I think. That ends my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parchment, for that wonderful presentation. Um, of course, now that we're back in school full-fledged, um, we will expect some of those data, that data to increase in all those categories. Thank you. So now uh, we will move on to our student report. Uh, we have Maylee Taylor and Victor May. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Victor May. Um, I'm the school president here at Hapkins High School. And this is the Vice President, Mayle Taylor. Um, so to start off, our student government has just completed their elections. Um, I'm president, vice president. Um, our secretary is Elena Moa, and our treasurer is Ava Marquez. So we are excited that there are many candidates to be really part of our school culture here. And the student council is planning an outdoor cup rally this year, and the details are being, are being finalized shortly. So the high school completed our, strong, our start strong assessments earlier this month for English 9, English 10, Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2, and Science. Uh, last week, all sophomore and junior students took the PSAT. The test results will be used for students to qualify for merit scholarships, practice for the SAT, and AP test. Our drop-in center continues to host welcome back events for our students. Events include mindfulness activities, meet and greets, and pumpkin pads coming soon. I'd like to give a sports update. Our fall sports are heading towards the postseason. Our tennis, cross country, volleyball, soccer, and football teams are all vying for the postseason spot. The high school has a rich tradition of athletics, and that is continuing this year. Curtis Whiting was named Athlete of the Week for his recent football performance. <laughs> he scored seven touchdowns in a game, breaking the school record. The next week, Amir Whittle was named Athlete of the Week for his record-breaking performance in cross-country. <laughs> we are proud of our student-athletes. The school also celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month with several fun activities, floor decorating contests, daily morning announcements celebrating history, songs, and classroom activities. Thank you. Anything else? That's all. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you for so now we will move to our superintendent's report, Mr. Sanchez. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, uh, Victor and, and uh, May Lee, for your presentation. 
So on behalf of the Board of Education, I would like to take a brief moment to thank all of our, all in attendance for your participation at our board meetings. During our board meetings, the board welcomes public comments at the designated time noted on the agenda. As a reminder, questions about schools, programs, and district operations are best posed to the appropriate administrator and department heads. The board trustees cannot answer questions with regards to the operations of the school district as that is not within their purview. Those re responsibilities fall upon the shoulders of the administrative team. As always, we ask that you contact the appropriate district administrator um, with your questions and concerns to receive the swift and accurate response. As a general rule, identified problems should be brought to the attention of the persons closest to the origin of the problem so that its resolution can be attempted at that level. When a resolution cannot be found at that level, remedy should be sought at the next level. With that said, we do continue to welcome your comments and participation. Ever since the July Board of Education meeting, there has been some commentary and questions about the topic of assistant principals at the elementary school. At said meeting, after the board came out of its closed session, I committed to the public that I would meet with the Administrators Association on behalf of the board to try to find a mutually beneficial sol solution to the elementary, assistant uh, elementary school assistant principal situation. And I did just that. To be clear, both sides have met to discuss a possible solution. And while I cannot discuss the details of any matters as they pertain to contract negotiations, I can tell you that we made an offer to the Administrators Association and it was rejected by them. As such, we offered support to the elementary schools by hiring additional social workers and morning and lunch supervision staff to assist the principals with the day-to-day -day operations of their schools. Next, I would like to ask our board attorney, Lester Taylor, to provide you all with an update with regards to ongoing contract negotiations with the various unions. Mr. Taylor. Sure, thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, first, um, just to comment on uh, your report, Mr. Sanchez, regarding public comment. Um, it's just important also for the members of the public, I say this in part because we have a lot of new faces here tonight, uh, that public comment is not a back and forth discussion, uh, period. It's the opportunity for the public to ask questions and or state their concerns. Um, as Mr. Sanchez indicated, if the administration and or uh, through the board leadership can answer, uh, they can, but it's important uh, that the member of the public speak during their allotted three minutes. Um, when they're completed, um, the administration and or board may respond uh, if appropriate. Um, just by way of background on negotiations to the extent we can comment on in public, um, from a procedural standpoint, uh, if and when a collective bargaining agreement or a contract expires, uh, in a public school setting, it's important to note that the parties, the employees, as well as the board are still bound by and otherwise covered by the terms and conditions of that expired agreement. So no one is ever uh, working without a contract in public employment. Uh, employees are still protected uh, by terms and conditions, uh, as well as the board is still obligated by law to follow the terms and conditions in that uh, expired agreement. Uh, the board has been negotiating in good faith uh, with various collect uh, unions, uh, bargaining units uh, in this district, uh, teachers, uh, support, professional associations, maintenance, etc. Um, over the past year, um, again, the parties have made some progress. Uh, when and if the parties were unable uh, to come to a mutually satisfactory agreement, uh, specifically regarding the teaching staff members, the HEA uh, union, uh, as well as the office professionals union, there's a process under. Uh, the Public Employment Relations Commission called impasse, uh, where the parties go to mediation. That's where a third party comes in uh, to try to help the parties come to an agreement. Uh, it's a non-adversarial process. Um, it's just one in which a third party comes in to help uh, both sides come a little bit closer to a meeting ground. Uh, the board has met with this committee uh, with the uh, teachers union um, at least seven times over the last year. Um, had at least one mediation session and has a next mediation session coming up on November 22nd. Uh, we hope that there is uh, a positive outcome from that. And with the office prof uh, support professionals, uh, we've had at least three meetings with them, uh, one mediation session uh, on September 28th, and we had one scheduled for October 28th, but I believe the union had a scheduling issue. And we look forward to meeting with them soon. Uh, so we just want the board um, as a body to have an update as well as uh, any concerned members of the public with respect to the uh, process as prescribed by law that both sides and for each respective union have been working in good faith towards reaching a satisfactory and mutually agreeable contract. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Mr. Taylor. So moving on, I'm happy to report that on tonight's board meeting, the board will be approving eight new coaches for our intramural sports program at the middle school. We will be offering cross country, soccer, and volleyball for our boys and girls. We can't wait to see our kids on the courts and fields. In closing, thanks again for your continued presence at our board meetings. Your interest in our schools is commendable. Now on to the enrollment report. Our current enrollment is 5,335 students, and a total of 21 HIV investigations were completed uh, this past month. So, um, you know, needless to say, with all of our students back, we do expect some of these numbers to start climbing. Um, but I can tell you that our teaching staff and, and school administrators are committed to the restorative practices, and, and we hope to keep these, uh, these numbers at bay. That concludes my report. All right, so we're moving on to public comments. Um, just a reminder, uh, so public participation is governed by the following rules. Uh, you should have signed in. Um, you state your name, municipality, and if you're affiliated with a group that it, you know, makes a difference for, this, you know, for these purposes. Um, you have three minutes, and then all statements should go to the presiding officer, and then um, at the end, the superintendent and or um, tonight me will either do our, my, our best to answer and or uh, may ask uh, a board member who it most um, closely relates to in their committee work to help answer that. So, yes, we're ready. Ready for anyone who would like to make public comments, please? Approach the microphone. Okay, so also just please remind all members of the public in attendance that pursuant to uh, Governor Murphy's executive order, uh, everyone must wear a mask when inside a public school building. Thank you so much for your compliance. Mr. Vickery, just so you know, it's very hard to understand you. Um, I don't know, they said like the mask is thick or, okay. so it's a little hard to understand you. Okay. I, I don't know, I know you can't take it off. Can I just make a quick statement before the timer starts, please? Um, while the HEA did not put out a public statement, I want Mr. Vickery and Mr. Oates to know that we do not condone threats or violence of any kind toward any of you, and especially because your children sit in our classrooms. Um, we. Um, we checked with like NJA and our legal, which is why uh, collectively we were not able to put out a statement, but I did talk to both of you personally and I wanted you to know that as a group, that is how we feel, that no one should ever have to be targeted with death threats or anything like that just because you've chosen to speak out. And we appreciate you. We appreciate the work you're doing. And we may not always agree, but we appreciate you and what you do and what you are attempting to do for this district. Just so you know that. Thank you. But with that, this is where you can start the timer. Okay. But with that, um, I felt like tonight was optics. Um, I, I, I'm disappointed that Mr. Powell is not here. Because as a board president, just like me standing here as the president, he represents all of you. Um, to say I'm disappointed is an understatement. To say that we are disappointed is an understatement. Because even what you saw with the world language and those departments, that is on the backs of teachers and educators who are consistently, and I've said this for the four years that I've been here, every time I sit up here, who are being disrespected, overworked, and we just, we can't seem to get this message across to all of you. There are issues that you know about and that you are pretending that you don't know. So let me point, let me just say this, and because everybody here, most of these people are going to speak tonight, so I don't have to say much. And I thank them for coming. Thank you so much. But one of the things I, I heard in a workshop that I attended recently and it was a man who grew up and he was in a special ed class. And he said one of the things, and it just stuck with me. He said, you can tell how a district values its students by the real estate that the students occupy. 
And so when they occupy crowded classrooms, when they occupy classrooms where IEPs are being violated, when they occupy bilingual classes that had 23 second graders I saw today in my school and no para, when they occupy classes where their teachers are being told to give a kid virtual instruction and, my, and man eight other or 10 other little pre-kindergartners, you, oh, sorry, 13. You have a problem with placing value on our children. I don't care if you don't like us. I don't care if you don't like the administrators. You seem to have a problem placing value on our children. So don't sit up here and tell me month after month after month, this is my fourth year as president, and you have said the same things over and over again, some of you. And I'll tell you this, and if Mr. Powell were here, I'll tell you where he puts the property value, on a tennis court. And I guess if our classes were on the tennis court, our kids would have more value in your eyes. Please tell him. I don't want to hear about the tennis courts anymore. And another thing, clean up the fields and clean up the, the, the what is that? The house, the, 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 the house, the field house. Because raw sewage came up on that field. And you did nothing to clean it, but to gloss over it. Unacceptable, unacceptable, unacceptable. And we're not taking it anymore. Time is up, man. Thank you, APA. Just to all members of the public, just please be reminded that pursuant to the public comment policy, you have a lot of time frame when your time expires. We would appreciate it if you would respect the time allotted and cease your comments. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, Anthony Ziza, Maple Hill Drive in Hackensack, proud parent of a Parker School special ed student. I'm here tonight because I'm very troubled by some of the things I'm seeing with the special ed program in this district. Stories I'm hearing from fellow parents, stories of their students in class support teachers pulled to cover because we can't get subs, paras, not where they're supposed to be. In general, legal liabilities that are unconscionable. These are the most vulnerable students in our entire system. And yet, I look through the agendas each month, resignations, churn, What's happening? I can tell you what's happening. When staff feel undervalued, they take off for greener pastures. They look at the fact they have the years in, it's time to retire. For every veteran staffer that we lose with 25, 30 years of experience, we're replacing with somebody that they cannot share that experience with. This board has consistently placed dollars and cents above the need of the students. The staffing, the understaffing is a consequence of teachers feeling undervalued. It's a consequence of an attitude that tells the staff, the people who I rely on to make sure that my son is getting the education he deserves, telling them that they are overpaid and underworked. This is something that needs to be addressed. We need to fund our program adequately. We need to make sure staffing is acceptable. And we need to make sure that we are not leaving teachers without special ed qualifications to watch over students because somebody is needed to cover a class. I know what my son is taking out of his education here. He comes home, he loves his teachers, he loves the people that he meets every day, and I really want to be able to say that he's getting what he deserves, but I'm not sure. Thank you.
Good evening, Joyce Wickersheim, Fairmount School, HEA building leader. I'm speaking on behalf of the teachers at Fairmount School. On one Friday in September, we did not have an administrator in the building. An incident occurred with some students during recess. The incident was of a, of a physical nature and the student who reported the problem was sent to see our school guidance counselor. The counselor came up to the classroom to follow up on what had occurred, but stated she was needed back in the office, so she took all of the students involved downstairs with her. She was handling the job of two administrators in addition to her own counseling. Any one of those three jobs in a lot for an individual to handle, not to mention all three at one time. During a year where so much of our professional learning centers on meeting students' physical and social emotional needs, decisions are not being made to support the safety and social emotional well-being of our students. This is a disservice to our students and in order for our guidance counselors and other specialists to meet the increasing needs of our student population, they need to be given the ability to effectively do their own job. Essentially, the services are not provided to our students when guidance and other staff are used to stop gap measures. Cutting down on building administrators at a time when the workload has increased and the safety is utmost importance does not seem logical at all. When the decisions were made to cut back on, an, on elementary assistant principals, a plan should have been in put in place to ensure that the schools would not operate without an administrator. During a pandemic, especially there must be a contingency plan for absences, which occur even during a normal year. The failure to come up with a plan to cover administrative absences is unacceptable, as was the failure of a district to take action and send in an administrator from somewhere in the district to cover our school on that day. Our school guidance counselor is truly one of the best. She is highly effective at her job working with the students, staff, and the families of our community. However, if the weight of running the school is placed upon her shoulders, while the expectation and necessity of continuing to do her own job simultaneously exists, we risk burning out one of Hackensack's finest educators. We cannot sit back and let watch this happen to our colleague, our school, and most importantly, to our students. Some other concerns that were brought to our attention that are not acceptable. There are part-time and full-time paras who are not highly qualified and certified covering teachers that are absent while we do not have subs in our schools. Nurses, due to the increased amount of students being sent to the office and the added workload that they have with keeping track of absences, students that have been tested and not, are not getting the uh, adequate time to take a lunch and prep. Special area teachers and counselors are also covering classes that teachers can attend PDs, resulting in classroom teachers missing preps, schedules being changed, and missing valuable teaching time. These are not acceptable things. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Bridget. I am a stakeholder and resident here in Hackensack. As I stand here before you, I'd like to thank the BOE first and foremost of the denouncement of the threat that was placed upon two sitting members in a timely manner. As a stakeholder here in the city of Hackensack, it was very disturbing to think that someone would place a threat on another human being's life and bring disruption to a person's household that has children. This is what I call a keyboard thug or a bully. Somebody not bold or brave enough to confront a person, but willing to bully behind a computer. It's sad that the community and district, even though it was late, I'm glad it wasn't never, did not rally around this heinous act what I would say is the act of a coward, a person with no humanity in the world of cruelty. We need to start showing each other some compassion for one another. It's disgusting to think that a person could sit behind a computer and then have the audacity to mail it to someone's home. They just got the wrong person, but if they got the right person, it'd be a, it would be a different story. But I'm so glad that the BOE decided to actually take place and step upon it as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Okay, good evening. Good evening. Um, 
My name is Nikisha Fulmore. I'm a Hackensack resident at Anderson Street, and I'm also a parent and an employee of Hackensack Schools. So excuse me, but these topics are very personal to me. With my three minutes, there are a few issues and concerns I would like to bring to your attention, and it has already been shared with you today. But I need to speak with them, speak with you about them, and I ask for you to please speak on them at the, before we adjourn this evening, if you can. One of them is the shortage of support staff, lunch aides, and paras in our schools. Many paras are being pulled to cover other classes, and this leaves our students who need support without support. When you pull out paras and support staff from classes, this also leaves our teachers stressed out, burnt out, and without the rapport for our students, it's great inconsistency. Two, the support staff shortage will lead to many of our good teachers and administrators feeling as if they are not supported, hence helpless. This brings me to the retiring of our dear Ms. Ashenloh, principal of Fairmount Elementary. I know she has worked tirelessly without VP support during this pandemic, and now is retiring for what I feel is not what she wants to do, but something that she has to do for her health, for her mental health and her sanity. And a lot of support for her role, and the board has not even prepared for her successor. So I'm asking for you to please speak to that point, because if we don't prepare for a successor, again, that leaves the students, the teachers, and administrators helpless. Third, is the district preparing to offer our children academic support? Coming back, many of them are below average. Are there funds being put towards programs that can assist with getting our children back on track? School is open. Now please support our teachers and our students by giving them not what they need, but what they deserve. Thank you. Good evening, um, Patty Burleson, third grade teacher. Um, last month, some of us were confused about comments about the buildings looking abandoned, as we have little control over that. But I can tell you that our classrooms were welcoming with bulletin boards and banners and name tags and smiles. Last week, last month, we came to the Board of Ed meeting that night to be seen on a night we were expected to be in our buildings. Back to school night was scheduled the same night as a board of ed meeting that we felt we should attend. When I first began teaching, I said no all the time. <clears throat> can I go to the bathroom? No. Can I go to the closet? Can I get a drink? No. I was trying to establish control. But you begin to realize that you can't say no for the sake of saying no. You have to say yes sometimes. Can I use crayons? Yes. Can I get something from the closet? Sure. Can I bring this book home? Yes. It builds trust and it shows respect. Back to school night for us was an easy yes for you. Parents were not coming to the building. We would present virtually. It would stand to reason we could do that from home. That was an easy yes. When the board tells us it's about the children, we all nodded in agreement. We are in it for the children. When teachers are treated with respect and kindness, that is for the children too. We are shamed for mentioning contracts or money. Teaching is a unique profession where an employee's nurturing nature is leveled against them. At the same time, those who say it's about the children are saving money by having us share assistant principals. This is untenable. <laughs> My school is losing a fabulous principal because what is being asked of her is untenable. One Friday in September, our principal was out sick. Our assistant principal was at her other school. We had no administrator in the building. Our school counselor and our reading specialist were asked to pick up administrative responsibilities. We began to reach out to central office about who could cover dismissal time because those ladies had children they had to pick up last minute. No one would be coming. At one point, we expressed to each other, what a good job we did. Everything, we worked well together. Luckily, nothing happened. But something did happen. After school, while students were walking home, an incident occurred that required a risk assessment. A risk assessment is a very big deal. 
We need authorities, counselors, all hands on deck. The only person in the building was our new secretary. She's very new and had no administrator in the building. We've only just begun and it's clear that assistant principal is not a part-time job. Principals already are buried under paperwork rather than being a presence and a force in the school for both the faculty and the students. Children are having issues on the playground because they aren't accustomed to playing together. And now we don't have any uh, administrators to help them solve those problems. Okay, when we have PD, they're herded into the auditorium and if, that, if it was a rainy day, that's the second time in the auditorium and it's no wonder they don't know how to play. Okay, you're saving money, but it's not for the kids. Hi, I'm Pat Shepard, Child Study Team at the high school. Uh, there are two significant characteristics that define a toxic, dysfunctional family. One is that the parent or parent dyad evades responsibility, whatever the cost, for the problems or dysfunction in the family and will always identify a scapegoat as being the source of the problem. The scapegoat is always a weaker family member, always uh, one of the children because of the power differential, differential. Usually the same child, but it can also switch from one child to another, depending on what responsibility the parents are trying to deflect. The result is despondent, traumatized, angry children. The second characteristic is that the dysfunctional family is what is called a closed system. Outsiders are kept ignorant of the family's internal toxic workings. On the outside to the world, the family looks efficient, functional and loving, invested in appearing to be the perfect family. The parents work hard to maintain the image, sometimes threatening the other family members or withholding essential resources to coerce them into playing along. So let's take this template and substitute parents for district administration. And when I say administration, I want to be very clear that I mean the superintendent's office and the board. The building administrators, that is the principals, vice principals, supervisor of guidance, work so hard and are doing the best they can with limited resources and support. But going back to the toxic dysfunctional system, based on what we've heard tonight, that's what the administration has become. And we are the despondent, traumatized, and angry children. Morale is very, very low. Administration makes misguided decisions and then evades responsibility for the fallout. And as we've heard, the fallout is big. But it's the building administrators, teachers, and other school personnel who are vilified and set up to take the blame. Administration deflects from the mess by talking about social emotional learning and caring for our kids, as if caring for the kids is not what we do every single day. Yes. Administration talks about the new lovely tennis courts, sorry Donna, I said tennis courts, <laughs> repairing the football field and adding shiny new lockers to the high school to demonstrate how much it cares. But as we have all heard from my colleagues, this is just gaslighting. Administration's self-proclaimed benevolence is a collective fantasy of misinformation. The truth is the system is broken. To our administrative moms and dads, you have failed to prevent the roof from collapsing. The good news is now that it has collapsed, at least the toxic mess can be exposed. I am grateful and honored to be among peers this evening as we attempt to expose the systemic dysfunction and work towards restoring the district to something that we can be proud to be a part of. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Shauna Shortridge, teacher, parent, Hackensack resident. Um, Oh. Adrian, you're going to have to give me a little more time because it takes time to breathe on, in the, under this mask. Okay. <laughs> I respectfully stand before you tonight asking you to reconsider splitting the VPs. Lunch and extra social work worker is not enough. I had the great honor of interning with Ms. Whitaker last summer through the summer of this year. I have in front of me not one but two binders of documented work completed in my internship. The areas in my binder addresses curriculum, finance, observations, scheduling, attendance, class placements, and so on. Not to mention the different areas under each umbrella. The work that administrators do is unbelievable. It's difficult, it's tiring, it's stressful, but it's necessary. 
There's no doubt that Mrs. Ashton Lowe, Mrs. Whiting, and Mr. Moran are doing their personal best. However, with all due respect, like you, Superintendent Sanchez, they need one, if not two, assistants. You have two phenomenal leading ladies, Mrs. Parchment and Mrs. Marks, who help to carry your load. It's not that I don't believe you're not capable of fulfilling your obligations, but with a district this size, six schools, and almost 6,000 students, you need assistance. We are all imperfect human beings living in an imperfect world, but can't we strive for a piece of perfection? It hurts me to see what we're doing to each other as a district, but more importantly, as people. Why can't we set an example for what a progressive district embodies? I commend this district on many things in the effort to make progress. However, in doing so, we hurt the very community which stands behind us. In my last class, which was school law, I proudly used this as examples for our district's main page. School policies, budgeting, thank you, Ms. Zeno. Special education, thank you, Mr. Pemberton. Cultural relevancy, thanks, Ms. Parchman. School letter to parents about homeschooling, Ms. Burke. Essa, thanks, Ms. Jones. School law, thanks, Mr. Mallon. HIB, search and seizure policies, uh, policies, LGBTQ, domestic violence at the high school, thanks, Mr. Celso King. Board policy, procedures, and training. Thanks, Mr. Powell, who's not here. And so I'm expecting the professor to come back and criticize my district. But no, she wrote numerous times um, in our Blackboard conversations, Sean and I quote, this is a great letter. That's a great tech platform for parents. I must admit, I was more critical of our district, knowing that there's so much we can do and need to improve. She was complimenting the fact that there are other districts which do far less and far worse. Some are neighboring districts. Do you not see how many people I acknowledge? That's because one person cannot do the job of many of the things I outlined. It took a group of intelligent people to help me find answers to my research, my questions, and helped me earn my EDS in administration, which I am not compelled to start anytime soon due to what I see current administrators dealing with daily. Board members, you work so hard, but you too need help. You form committee chairs, aka leaders, but he or she has help. Not because the chair, you're gonna have to pardon me. Not because the chair is incompetent or incapable. Excuse okay. me, ma'am, your time is up. Thank you. I'm taking a minute from someone See, else. Ma'am, you're really not because the policy doesn't allow you to do that. So thank you. Your time is up. Please have a seat. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Board members excuse me, work so excuse me, hard, miss. Excuse but me, miss. you too excuse need me, help. Can you please state your name you for form, the record, My please. name is Gwenny Burt. Happy Thank you so much for complying comment. with the board's policy. Thank you, you form committee chairs, a.k.a. leaders, but he or she has help. Not because the chair is incompetent or incapable of performing the duties, but because we all need help with something. Mr. Lawyer, you too need an assistant to help you sift through the case files, some as thick as the policy, dust in vacant Please address your comments to the chair, not to any individual in the Thank you so much for respect and complying with the conclude, board's policy. Excuse Thank me, you. I'm still speaking. I'm, I'm just speaking you the policy, from experience, Thank sitting, standing, walking, and even trying to sleep because Ms. Whitaker does not sleep. And in, in, in my administrative capacities and position as an intern to complete over 700 hours, getting only a snippet, the workload cannot be fulfilled by one person on a daily basis. My pastor teaches that if, he had, if, he, if the head is not right, the entire body suffers. Think about what you're doing to the head of each school and how it trickles down to the teachers and the students. The teachers are exhausted beyond exhausted. In conclusion, let's redirect our focus to building a better school district by setting a clear and shared focus, high standards and expectations for everyone effective school leadership through collaboration and communication. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Megan Graham. I am a resident of Hackensack, New Jersey. 
It is quite concerning that the BOE made the decision to cut only elementary school assistant principals and approve it along community, along, although, excuse me, community members questioned it at the board meeting in July. We were promised that you all will look into this matter. I think that it's imperative that our students get more support rather than receiving less. Don't you think that they have suffered enough with COVID? Can you answer these questions for me tonight? What is the protocol when our principal is out sick and our shared assistant principal is scheduled to work at Nellie K. Park? Should our schools be operating with no administrator in the building? Now that Ms. Ashton Loeb is leaving in January, beginning of February, what are their next steps for our children? Is there interviews in place? Will they sh will the interviewee shadow Ms. Ashton Loeb, who knows our buildings inside and out? So who will be hired and when? And when will the news be shared with the students and the parents? This is a total disservice to our children and should be a question of concern for this board. As the PTA present, concerned parent, and advocate for all children, too much change is not always good for them. If our main concern is about the future of Hackensack, take a moment and think about how this change will affect the future of our children. We need more administrative coverage. Fairmont is the largest elementary school in this, in this district, and yet we have the same coverage as the three other elementary schools. We are dealing with COVID and we get less. We are Fairmont strong. Please help us get stronger by adding more support. We need more, not less. Right. Ms. Megan, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Good evening. My name is Albania Bojos, and I am the PTA Vice President of Fairmont School. I am currently pursuing my second master's degree, not that anyone care, but my love for school came because I have had so many wonderful teachers and administrators in my lifetime who have inspired me to keep learning, just like the many amazing teachers we have in our school district. That being said, it's so sad to see what's going on in our schools. We have so many wonderful teachers and administrators who are not getting the support and need that they deserve. Uh, my son has been at Fairmont for three years so far, and his teachers have been phenomenal. Ms. Kukuza, Mrs. Wickersham, and Ms. She, thank you so much for what you do for our children every day. <clears throat> and, Ms. <clears throat> and Mrs. Ashton Lowe, thank you so much for doing the impossible. You are the best, absolutely the best. Um, I am so saddened that our fantastic principal, Mrs. Ashtonov, is leaving the school. She is some, someone who has dedicated her entire life to these kids. What she has accomplished, especially during the pandemic, is beyond remarkable. But no one should have to do it without any help. Now, if you ask me, Mrs. Ashtonov has shown day after day how much, how much she cares, not only with words, but with her actions, unlike some people here on this panel. I seriously don't understand how taking away resources and not providing help is beneficial for our kids. It is simply math, really. Subtractions always equals less. And I have that tough time understanding how less is good for our children. You rushed everyone to come back in person, and now, you, now that we are, you're taking away resources? As a member of the Fairmont, as a member of the Fairmont School community, and more importantly, as a parent, I ask that you start talking the talk and start walking the walk. You say you care, but your action says otherwise. Just don't say it, show it. Once again, to all the teachers and administrators here tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening, everybody. Frank Campolo, a 50-year resident of Hackensack. Went to Hackensack Public Schools an educator in Hackensack Middle School. I just want to uh, celebrate, I'm, I'm celebrating right now, I'm very happy for world language. 
uh, very excited to you know see the successes of the students at the high school level and definitely look forward to the other levels you know just seeing successes and, and improvements I really uh, appreciate that so I'm here also to support my colleagues a little short and sweet thank you very much for having me Hello, good evening, Boyd. My name is Mike Graham. I'm a resident of Hackensack. And, you know, my little issue is having respect from some members of the board, you know. I don't, you know, condone violence or anything like that or any of that stuff I heard tonight about death threats. But also, would like, you know, for board members to have respect for, you know, the parents of the community and the teachers and the other kids of the community. You know, and um, you know, one morning I'm, drop, I'm dropping my kid off, and a gentleman is blocking the, you know, the intersection for over five minutes, five to seven minutes. We I mean, I have to go think, do things as well. Got out my vehicle, asked the gentleman to move, you know, to pull up a little bit so we could get space. The whole 15, 20 cars backed up. Gentleman tells me, "Don't worry about it." I'm the vice president of the board. Go sit back in your vehicle. This is what he tells me. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm coming up to you, you know, very nice, polite, and asking you, you know, and as a board member, you used to say, hey, I'm, a, you know, you should not be blocking the intersection. You're supposed to be trying to, you know, let everything move through slow, you know, smoothly and be respectful to, you know, other people. You can't, you can't ask for respect and don't give respect. You know, we need to respect one another and respect our children. And he had children in the vehicle as well. Talking to me like this, get back in your vehicle. This is only school morning. I just don't appreciate that. And I think that, you know, we should talk and we respect each other as human beings. We are here and we want our kids to get the best education. And we should not communicate with each other at all like that. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Suzanne Greenberg. I'm a pre-K special ed teacher at the ECDC. I am here in support of the part-time paraeducators at the Hackensack ECDC. As a special education pre-K teacher at the ECDC, I know how valuable a properly trained paraeducator is for a classroom and students. The paraeducators at the ECDC are highly, highly skilled and extremely hardworking. They are critical to ensuring a safe, nurturing, and successful classroom for our students. The PARA's duties include helping to maintain a safe classroom by assisting in rigorous cleaning, helping to implement, implement instructional practices for small group activities, helping to maintain a safe and supportive instructional environment, monitoring document student progress using checklists and charts, assisting and teaching students basic self-help skills during meal times, assisting students with toileting needs, and most importantly, being hands-on and interactive with their young learners all day long. They literally don't get a break. <laughs> with that said, I feel strongly that our part-time educators are long due for a raise in their hour hourly rates. Five years ago was the last time that our part-time paraeducators received a raise. Five years ago. With the cost of living increasing every year, especially during COVID times, our part-time paras deserve some sort of increase in pay. Not only have our part-time parents not received a raise in five years, but there are zero growth opportunities available for them to work hard and be rewarded with for full-time positions. Why, you might ask? This is because our district no longer offers full-time paraprofessional positions, which means no matter how well a para performs in their job, they'll never be rewarded with a full-time position. What incentive does the district give our part-time paras? How does the district expect to keep highly qualified employees when they do not show them that they're a valuable asset to our district. <laughs> it is clear that there's no incentive and the district does not have value them enough to give them opportunities for growth. Right now, we have a huge shortage in paraprofessionals and it's not only due to COVID. They are fleeing our district and going to other districts that offer them more opportunities, better pay, and our health benefits. 
It has been very concerning that we have recently been informed that our district is now hiring lunch aides at the rate of $22 an hour. I understand that having lunch aides is very important, but the fact that this is higher hourly rate than some of our experienced paras is frankly unfair. Especially knowing that the part-time para salary has been frozen for some time at the lower, rate, lower hourly rate, which is $20 per hour. Our current part-time parents are highly qualified, meaning they must pass a power protest and have a minimum or have a minimum of 60 college credit. Our lunch aid's duties are significantly less compared to those of our part-time parents. By paying the lunch aides more than some of our part-time parents, it's devaluing the importance of their position and harms the team's already low morale. The district needs to work harder to keep our qualified part-time parents for our students. Um, to the, the chair, if I just, in order to, I guess, manage expectations, just remind uh, members of the public, specifically union leadership, um, as they may be aware that pursuant to the Public Employment Relations Commission, uh, the parties, uh, specifically the board, um, but also the union, cannot negotiate in public. Uh, so when it comes to salary and full-time, part-time, et cetera, um, as I indicated in my update earlier, the parties are in negotiations. Uh, the board cannot and will not respond uh, to any Thing that is a negotiable topic. I just want everyone to be aware of that to the extent that you're requesting responses. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shanetta Harris and I'm a part-time para at ECDC. And I just wanted to continue with what Ms. Greenberg, where she left off. Thank you, Ms. Greenberg. Um, not only have we not received a raise in five years, but also taking consideration that we arrived before the students and we leave after the students. Our work day is a full-time day. And we are here giving our concerns. I understand there's no negotiation that can be done tonight, but we are requesting our concern. We are stating our concerns and we are requesting that our part-time parents be considered at some point to be made full-time that it will alleviate some of the issues that we're having as a staffing issue right now. And also, also when it comes to a point where we have to have lunch aides that are making more than our paraprofessionals who are there all day with the students, who assist the teachers, I arrive, my work time is from, starts at 8.55. I arrive at 8.25. That is my choice because my teacher has to do her prep. She, she has to do her, her lesson plans. And I cannot arrive at 8.55 and set out breakfast for our, our students. And our children arrive five minutes later. That is chaotic. We have to have, we have to have some kind of balance in our school and our classroom so that when our children, when our students enter, they enter into a calm environment and they can feel it, they see it and they know it. And we cannot have someone assisting in the ABA classes who are not trained. Because, because what happens is it increases it increases health issues for the students and for the teachers as well. So what we're doing tonight is we're asking you to take in consideration to give us some help. We need help. And ECDC is where it starts. We are the beginning before our students enter into kindergarten all the way up to the 12th grade. This is where it starts. So we're just here tonight to voice our concerns, to put it on the table so that you can take a moment, understand our concerns so that we can continue with this program. We need this program. I am a Hackensack resident. My daughter graduated from Hackensack High School. I was a PTA president at Hillers for three years. I, I, I just, we need help. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Danielle Kokuza, and I'm happily at Fairmount School. I'm a special ed teacher there for preschool, but I'm formally part of the ECDC family. So I'm speaking in, in, um, up for that ECDC family. It starts with, in 2013, an opportunity arose for the opening of the Early Childhood Center. This magnificent idea was created to free up space in the gro for the growing students in the elementary schools, and it would give the early childhood educators an opportunity to collaborate work together, integrate classes, and keep all of the therapists in one building. We were all hesitant to the changes, not knowing what this new chapter would bring to us, and we were saddened to leave our former homes and our work families, but we did not have a choice. We moved. Being that resilient educators that we are and paraprofessionals, we created a new home for our students in the building that was not equipped to hold three and four-year-olds in gen ed or special ed. We were given one building administrator and one secretary, while all the other schools had two formally in their buildings. Our entire school had only one full-time custodian with a part-timer on the side. In that short amount of time that we have been in ECDC, we have gone through four different building administrators and four or five different administrative assistants. Our building supervisors and building administrators knew that we were being mistreated and they told us that our hands were tied and they couldn't help us. When the concerns were presented to administration and the board office and the board members, we were told that the, that we are, the resiliency, res residency is temporary, excuse me. We were told the district was leasing the building for two to three years. We were told that the plans were in the work for a state-of-the-art building with all the amenities and staffing. We would not need to conduct a truly successful, that we would need to conduct a truly successful ACDC program, early childhood program. Well, it's nine years later and we're still there. And I could tell you, I know some people helped that our, our building that they had students that in, when we were in, they were in preschool that helped it, uh, with our building. Before our move to ECDC, every pre-K teacher was assigned to two half-day sessions except for our full-day ABA programs. All general education classes had full-time paras, and each special education class had two to three paras. Sometimes they had four full-time paras, depending on the needs of the students to assist with the rigorous daily scheduling and change challenging behaviors. Now we are lucky if we have one part-time para. All time, or at times, teachers are, teachers are being left alone with no assistance because we are short staffed. And it's true. And it's, I know it's my administrator tries not to do anything like, you know, not to have me alone, but sometimes I'm alone because if my power goes out sick, we can't get somebody to be with me. I have to dismiss at the, day, at the end of the day in the other building with nobody there. But I also have to do my whole day and not take a lunch. We need to help. Good evening. My name is Carmela Zuccaro, formerly Carmela Tripodi. I was first hired in this district when um, I was 16 years old. Uh, this October, I've been uh, employed by the Hackensack Public School System for 29 years, proudly. I'm also a graduate of Hackensack High School, and um, I'm proud to say I'm from Hackensack. When, um, this is a continuation from Danielle. When we began at ECDC, we were also told that the students will no longer get the special instructions that they were given in the elementary schools. For example, physical education, art, and music. We do not even have an outdoor area or playground, which is required by the state. Our 40 minute prep time was now moved to the first period of the school day because of this decision. The 40 minutes included the 10 minutes that every other teacher in the district gets from 8.20 to 8.30, aside from their 40 total minutes of prep. Those first 10 minutes of school allow for teachers and parents to check in, check mailboxes, get to the classroom, and turn on computers. We now have to include those duties within our prep time. We also had to cut our preparation time short by another 10 minutes because we were required to greet our students and parents at 8.50 every morning so we would be able to start our instruction at 9 a.m. sharp. From 8.25 until 9 a.m., from 8.25 until 9, teachers are required to clean and sanitize tables, chairs, and manipulatives that are used daily. Go downstairs to the cafeteria to pick up breakfast. Set the breakfast up at the tables for each student. Create lesson plans. Create materials for the units of study that are added into the different learning centers every single day. Log on to TS Gold. Check the student's individual documentation status on TS Gold. Identify the objectives that the students will be working on for that day and score the documentation that were recorded the day before. Log on to Genesis. Log on to our online lunch menu because it changes daily and we needed updated, updated versions and they were not notified. All of these duties are to be done before 9 a.m. 
Based on these requirements, it is evident that we need another prep time added to our schedule. Every other teacher and parent in the elementary school dismiss at 2.50, which allows for teachers and parents to return to the classroom, clean up, and sign out by 3.05. We, on the other hand, were told that our students needed to have instructional time until 3 o'clock. This gives us five minutes to dismiss three and four-year-olds who were picked up by the car or very late buses. Needless to say, we have never been able to clock out by 3.05. We are here asking for your help. We are not here to complain. We, are, we have been trying to meet with you for the past eight, nine years that we've been at ECDC privately. We've called you over to our school. We've called board members over. We've called administrators. We're begging you for help. We are barely making it out alive. Hi, my name is Barbara Kroniak. I'm a special ed teacher at ECDC. I'm going to continue from what Carmela said. As highly educated professionals, our job description as a Hackensack public school teacher has changed drastically these past few years. We are not treated like the professionals we work so hard to become. We are required to be the uncertified gym teacher, setting up the same equipment daily in the gymnasium for the students to utilize to make up for the 30 to 40 minutes of outdoor play that they do not receive. We have become the uncertified art teacher, the music teacher, and the lunch aides. We were told that lunch is an instructional time for our students. Our instructional time is spent opening up milk cartons and prepackaged microwave lunches that are difficult for our three and four year olds to open. We have to serve lunch to our students, lay out their personal mat with fitted sheets and blankets, and we have to put students down to nap before taking lunch, which is, which is never before 1240 or 1250. Some of us had to take lunch at 1.25 and as late as 2 o'clock. Some teachers have been able, unable to take their full 40 minutes because of our strict schedule. Some teachers are hesitant to take a lunch because they do not feel comfortable leaving their students with lunch aides that have been hired to fill in for certified paraprofessionals that are no longer working for our district or have been transferred out of our school within the past few weeks to fill in for the shortage of staff members in other schools in this district. Because of the many changes in our programs, we have also lost many valuable employees. Teachers in Paris have applied to other districts with less pay because our requirements have become physically and mentally debilitating. I would just like to say as an ABA teacher that was out the Paris, they work just as hard. They have to do so much training on rethink and all the curriculum that we have to do, and they're not getting any incentive for it. They're not, there's no reason for them to stay. They're not getting what they deserve and they are working very hard, could not do it without them. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Domenica D'Angelo, also a product of the Hackensack Public Schools. The ECDC teachers and paraprofessionals are some of the hardest working women in this district. They are trained professionals that work with students that need individualized care every second of the day is physically and mentally exhausting. They are trained in DTI and handle with care. Our paraprofessionals have been greatly disrespected by the choices that have been made by the present and former board members and administrators regarding their status in this district. We have part-time paras that have never missed a day of work, never missed a day of work last year. And she was never acknowledged for her dedication to her job. We have now offered uncertified lunch aides more money hourly than our certified paraprofessionals. The lunch aides are working less hours, they have fewer responsibilities, and they're making more money than the trained professionals working in our building. This has devastated our entire staff. Our part-time paraprofessionals work 15 to 20 minutes shy of a full-time worker every day. And again, they have not received a raise. Some of our ABA paraprofessionals have requi are required their RBT certification and do not get any additional pay or stipends for their highly intensified and specific job they do every day. Some have come in early without being paid extra because they know how much work the teachers need to prepare before the students come into the classroom. It was not for the if it's not for the love of the students and their professional, and the respect 
that we have for one another, some of the powers that are left in our building will have no other choice but to leave and find a different district to work in, as most have already done so. A staff member wrote a letter to the board members and board office listing the ramifications for not hiring full-time powers. She never received a response. We have asked them, we have asked them to, for them to reconsider keeping our power professionals full time. We knew what the outcome and these decisions would be. Really quick, we're here not to ask you, not to tell you. We're here to beg you. We need your support. Like my mother always said, if you have a problem, you go to family. You are our family. We are coming to you and everybody else that makes these important decisions for our school district and your children. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Veronica Hernandez and I too am a product of the Hackensack School District. I am a preschool teacher, a special ed preschool teacher at Jackson Avenue School and I was at ECDC when we first opened. Well, here we are. Many of the teachers in our school have never had two part-time paras that were supposed to be replaced by full-time paras, as promised. They were only given one part-time para, which means that at a certain point of the day, the teachers left alone with up to 15 three and four year old children. Due to the pandemic, we are faced with challenges that we have never seen in this magnitude. To say we are short staffed is an understatement. However, we question the safety of our students due to the staffing. Please do not take our words here tonight as an attack against you. We are barely making it out alive each day. We walk past each other in the hallways in disbelief that what was once the happiest and best career choice for all of us is now making us mentally and physically sick because of poor planning at our expense. <clears throat> we are here because we know you have the power to make these changes. We are willing to all sit with you on our own personal time and try to come up with better solutions that will work for everyone involved. A brief walk through our building will not give you the experiences that you are dealing with daily, that we are dealing with daily. This matter is urgent and it needs to become a priority. So please, sincerely, Hackensack Pre-Kindergarten staff. Yeah. How are you, Corey Carroll? Teacher, product of the school system, parent of two graduates. This is not a problem that started due to the pandemic. Please understand that. This has been happening for over 10 years in this district. From superintendents to directors of special ed, change after change after change. We had to keep doing what we had to do for our children, but we're getting sick. People are getting diagnosed with cancer at rates that are un unimaginable. Why? The stress is unbelievable. I, I think I, when I get ready for work and I take a shower is where I do my best thinking. <laughs> and I say, why after 26 years is it so miserable? But there's another group of people that can stand with us and those are the nurses. Why are the nurses so miserable? And you know what I came to the conclusion? We are women on the front lines. We are not treated as professionals. You guys look around this room and the women here are standing up. Where are they? It's the women that are fighting for our lives. From power professionals, that are women and you're paying them $20. My daughter just got a job babysitting for $25. Babysitting. You're talking about special ed kids who need certain things and $20 an hour is atrocious. There has been a job posting for a high school teacher for eight months. Eight months. How many applications do you think we got? I'm going to give you the answer. It's zero. <laughs> do you know why? People don't want to come here. They're not coming. I got four phone calls from four different districts this summer. Four. For me to leave here with my t-shirt and handicap and go there. What are we doing? Waiting for them to come? Like, if you build it, they will come? 
<laughs> Nobody's coming. We pay twenty dollars an hour. Look at uh, Burton County Special Services. They're, they, the cars can move today. Full time benefits. Look it up. You expect people to stay here? And you know who's hurt? The kids in the special ed department that have not had a teacher yet. There's a classroom in the high school. There's a classroom in the middle school. There's a classroom in Melanie Parker. And you know what? The blood is on your hands. Because you can make a difference. You can start, start doing initiatives. Other districts are doing initiatives to pull people in. We sit here like they're going to drop from the sky. It is embarrassing. Our district is imploding. It's imploding. I am talking people off the ledge daily, crying. They're leaving. Your, your staff is leaving. Excuse your, me, time, special time up, thank you. Thank your special ed department is leaving. Okay, your time is up. Thank you. I'm done. You should have let me go before you. <laughs> what a tough fact to follow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Buenas noches. <laughs> I wasn't planning on speaking tonight. If you know me, I'm very shy. <laughs> and I'm very emotional and I always cry. And I will cry. <laughs> uh, you'll cry with me because that's how I feel. <laughs> my name is Soraya Gonzalez. And I'm a Spanish teacher at the high school. So I was here because of the world language presentation. But after my students left and I saw my colleagues speak, I could not leave. I believe blue and gold. I came from Colombia in 1982 to the middle school. Graduated middle school. Was a student at Hackensack High School here. ESL bilingual student. Graduated in 1988. Did a lot of things, but I always knew I wanted to come back to Hackensack and teach. I wouldn't, I always said that I didn't want to teach anywhere else. I was on the board of it twice, so I know what it's like to be on the other side when I was in my 20s. And I decided to be a um, Spanish teacher, to be a role model to my students. And you see the wonderful programs that we have. And for the first time in 18 years, I went to my principal and I said, I can't believe I'm thinking about leaving. Yeah. Because my heart is here. But what I hear, this is not Hackensack. It's not. It's not the Hackensack that I know from when I came from Colombia. It's not. From what I hear from all the schools. We get kids coming into the high school every day. We don't have enough teachers. The ESL bilingual Spanish classes are full to capacity. What are we doing? I see myself in those kids. I see myself in those kids. I talk to them. I tutor them. I tell them, come after school. I do whatever. And, and you see the, the same from all the teachers. But you're the ones because I was there to make these decisions. And you don't want to see us leave. I really, really, really want you to consider these decisions. I, I could not believe what I hear. And again, I'm saying the same thing over and over. This is not the Hackensack that I know from 1983 till now. I've done a lot of different things. I worked in Wall Street. I have two masters. I worked in social work. I taught college. But this is where I want to be. I love these kids. I love the kids like all of us do here. But please, please listen to everyone. Muchísimas gracias. Hi, my name is Tanya Feliz Patron. How are you? So um, I too came because I was invited to come 
And I was so, I mean, I was back there taking pictures of the students presenting because out of all of them that were presenting, six are mine. And I would never go back to engineering. The kids tell me all the time, why are you here? Why don't you want to be an engineer? I did seven years and teaching to me has been the most um, rewarding career I had. And a lot of people ask me where I teach and I teach in Hackensack. I'm not from Hackensack, but the pride that I see Whoever came up with that t-shirt that the kids are wearing now was a genius because there's so many different districts and now I see a little bit more blue and gold. I see a little bit more pride. Um, I, I teach STEM to a lot of uh, freshmen and the program has grown. There's a lot of robotics students now. I have 20 kids, I can't push them away. I'm very, very proud of the connection that we've been having with Fairleigh Dickinson University and a lot of students are pursuing some aspect of engineering because they're being uh, introduced early and, and all these good things. And I feel awful that I've been in a little bubble. There's five of us, well, now newly six in my, in my um, department. And I had no idea that this was happening. I made a point this year to participate in Hispanic Heritage Month, which was great. Thank you, Soraya. It was phenomenal walking around with our dresses. Um, but also made it a point to say, this year I'm gonna participate more in HEA. I'm gonna get a little bit more knowledge. I actually was, I thank you for um, allowing me to participate, Cassine, because you were one of the people I spoke to most. But the idea that my, my children are a little older. They're already, uh, my old, youngest is graduating high school. But to, to think that, any of my family members who are in Hackensack uh, could suffer, have their son or daughter suffer because their teachers don't have enough to provide for them really breaks my heart. And as a fellow uh, teacher, I can't imagine not having that pencil. I teach drawing, I teach pencils and computers and not having all those equipment, I can't imagine not being able to say to a kid, here's a, a learning a tool for you to be able to, to explore and move on even further. So please listen to my colleagues. Please listen to the ideas that our students are our future. And um, <laughs> blue and gold, I mean, come on. If you don't believe it, then you're not really here. And that's part of who we are. And honestly, I, I'm i very proud to be a teacher here. And I've been trying to promote, I'm trying to get more teachers in the CTE program. And I just can't, nobody's biting. It's, it's, it's so difficult to promote a district that honestly I had no idea had so much hardships. So please listen and thank you so much for being here. I promise, I promise it's fast. I promise it's fast, y'all. Pardon me. Uh, Tony Jackson, Hackensack, Hackensack, Hackensack. Um, I, ev everything that has been said, I echo all of it. Uh, I don't have too much to say. Um, I want to say two things. One, is that I want to bring up the fact that we can ex extend the accessibility by making this virtual and, and offering the opportunity for those who are not here to see what's going on and to participate as well. Um, and as, as we continue to talk about accessibility and inclusivity, it's right there. It's right there. And the last time that I brought that up, it was brought up that this is being done the correct way. We're, we're not saying you don't have to do this. We're not saying you're not doing this the right way. We're just saying that you can include more people. The last thing I want to say is that it feels so strange to be walking out of here with a plaque about sustainability. Because what we're seeing is that this is not sustainable. So, so, so as, as, as an amazing district with an amazing, amazing community that we serve, we are telling you right now that it is not sustainable and we cannot continue to brand or market ourselves as such, knowing that this is what's really happening. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, uh, Tom Trezano, um, Hackensack High School teacher, and also a uh, rep in the HEA uh, as a health and safety chairperson. And uh, I think um, I'm lucky to work with such amazing people, honestly, um, people who really give their um, all to the profession that they've chosen. Uh, you know, they've answered a calling and they've answered a calling to each other. And so I applaud you all for that. I think that's uh, admirable. Um, I think also, um, you know, echoing and kind of piggyback on what Tony was just saying, I, I think it has a little bit to do with being proactive proactive as opposed to reactive. I think what we've been listening to for the last few meetings that I've attended 
um, going back pretty much for about half of my career, is that it seems as though we're constantly trying to catch up to where everybody else is at. Uh, we're not making uh, active plans, thinking five years in the future in a lot of cases. Instead, we're constantly kind of going up against a situation where we're trying to be compliant. The idea that we have to, you know, wait a, for a hundred years of a building's life to begin to think about installing elevators that are now being installed when that technology has been around since, I mean, Hoboken was invented. I mean, really, you're talking about a really long time. Um, the other thing that I think I'm hearing is a, a matter of, um, of concern about transparency. Um, you know, questions being offered and asked, and then a, a lack of response in a timely fashion. Um, it seems defensive, it seems protective, it seems uh, alienating to a, a staff that is genuinely concerned and looking uh, for uh, apt leadership and apt answers. Uh, there seems to be not enough answers and not enough information. Um, you know, I was also uh, kind of considering a, a number of things that have, have come across um, as the health and safety chairperson. Uh, some of which are building issues that have been brought up before, but also just, uh, you know, obvious uh, security issues. There are issues in our district that have to do with SROs and being able to be responsive on specific campuses, uh, having somebody manning those positions and a lack of person manning those positions should raise major concerns for all of us. Uh, the impacts of Ida still being unresolved. Uh, maybe we're waiting for insurance checks to clear. Uh, maybe those checks have cleared and they're sitting in accounts and now are earmarked for other things. Uh, but I know that there are many people who have um, uh, materials that are no longer available to them because of the loss uh, at, the, at the floodwaters of Ida. Um, never mind the sanitization issues, which have been covered before. Uh, the concern about IP, IEP mandates, the special ed um, issues that have been brought up earlier today are, are critical to the, the functioning of our community. Uh, from top to bottom should concern everybody. Uh, the improper supervision of students in general, uh, regardless who's in, you know, being placed in charge, should be uh, tantamount for our concerns um, in providing a fair and equitable and just um, situation for every single one of our students so they can end up getting the proper training, uh, proper teaching, and be successful. And then, um, you know, I think probably the last one that I'd have is a I guess if you want, I'll email you my list. All right. I got about 30 things on here. I got to like five. Okay. So um, I think that brings us to the end of public comments. Um, this is my first time of presiding over this, so I will be, um, doing the, the answering part when it's time for that, um, in a little bit of a different way this time. Um, so now we need to, to move to our, um, resolution. First, um, I have so many notes now, uh, right here, um, so we need to approve our minutes board be it resolved uh, that the Hackensack Board of Education approves the regular meeting minutes and closed session minutes of September 20th, 2021 as submitted. Uh, can I have a motion to approve those minutes? Ms. Lassane? A second. I'll second. Do we need to do a roll call for that? Yes. A roll call, please. It is moved by Mr. Sane, seconded by Mr. Goodman, mm -hmm. Mr. Coleman. Yes. Mr. Nolly? Yes. Mr. Goodman? Yes. Mr. Hussain? Yes. Mr. Oates? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. James Vickery? Yes. Manager moved. Okay. So, so we'll move into personnel. Um, <clears throat> so um, I present to the board um, actions A, 1, A through V. Can I have a motion since I'm presiding? I need someone else to do a motion. Ms. Lassane, thank you. Mr. Oates seconded it. Roll call, please. And the roll call for items A, 1 through Z. Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Nolly? Yes. Mr. Goodman? Yes. Mr. Sane? Yes. Mr. Oates? 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Moving to policy, Mr. Oates. Good evening. Uh, two items for our first read on the policy. Uh, emergency virtual remote instruction program mandate that's new that pretty much is uh, dealing with uh, when there's a state of emergency declared there's a lot into that you have any questions reach out also p uh, <clears throat> pnr 5751 sexual harassment now it's changed mandated sexual harassment of students with other mandated provisions uh, and the rest for the uh, second reads if you have any questions with any of these please reach out also a special note uh, mrs denali uh, is not up for re-election this time, and I just want to tell you it was a pleasure having you on our committees with the policy and the buildings and grounds, and you'll be missed, and uh, you're one of the best. Uh, put these forward, B1, B2. There's a motion. We have a second. Mr. Coleman. <coughs> Roll call. On policy B1 and 2, Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Nolly? Yes. Mr. Goodman? Yes. Mr. Sain? Yes. Mr. Oates? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. James Vickery? Yes. Motion Thank you. Moving to curriculum, Mr. Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. I offer uh, curriculum resolution C2 through C19 uh, for approval by the board. Can I have a second? A second. Mr. Goodman. Move then, Mr. Coleman, seconded by Mr. Goodman. Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Nolly? Yes. Mr. Goodman? Yes. Mr. Sain? Yes. Mr. Oates? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. James Goodman? Yes. Motion to Thank you. Moving to uh, finance, uh, Mr. Goodman. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming tonight. Uh, on the finance committee, I, I offer items D1 through D12. The Make a motion. Mr. Oates seconded. Roll call, please. On items 3, 1, 12, Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Nolly? Yes. Mr. Goodman? Yes. Mr. Sain? Yes. Mr. Oates? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. James Pickery? Yes. Um, for buildings and grounds, we have um, E1. Through E12, um, for your consideration tonight, can I have someone move that for me, please? Um, Mr. Denali. Second, Mr. Goodman. Roll call, please. Mr. Coleman. Yes. Mr. Denali. Yes. Mr. Goodman. Yes. Mr. Sain. Yes. Mr. Oates. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mr. James Gifford. Yes. Mr. Thank you. So. Oh, no. Did you talk? Did you Thank you. Um, so a lot's been said. So um, there's been a lot that's happened tonight, and I thank you for um, coming and standing together. Um, so I've tried to take some notes and group them somewhat accordingly so that I can ask the appropriate person to respond um, so that, that you can leave with the best answer that we can provide tonight some things in full disclosure may take us to come back but i will make sure that it comes back to this table um so first let me so again we we work on um a, a high level of like policy and and things and, and so the the daily running of the schools is not in our purview so i'm going to specifically ask some of the things of mr sanchez and if you need to to move that forward to to one of your assistants uh that, that's fine so specifically um let's start with um the shortage of support staff lunch aids slash paras Sure. So I'll start briefly, and then I'm going to ask um, our new HR manager to speak a little bit about, you know, staff shortages in general throughout the state. Um, so what I can tell you is all of the positions have been posted, so we're not hiring for, for lack of trying. Um, all of the lunch assistants, paras, and, um, and teaching staff, really, they're interviewed at the school level, um, special services to positions interviewed with the Department of Special Services. 
Um, they're, you know, look actively looking for candidates. Whenever we find candidates, if, um, if those recommendations are pushed up to me, I push them forward. Um, so we're not, not holding, we're not holding back on hiring of any lunch assistant or para or anything of, of, of that like. Um, Mr. Adedoyan, perhaps you can share some insight of, you know, what you've learned uh, that's going on really, not just in New Jersey, but throughout the country. Um, good evening, uh, everyone. So just like Mr. Sanchez just alluded to, um, it's a national issue that we're, we're facing. It's not just Bergen County or New Jersey. I just came back from a conference and um, in Washington, D.C. And uh, the problem <clears throat> is that we're competing with uh, Uber drivers, Uber East drivers. It, it, it's, it's an alarming thing that we have to kind of... If, if we may... Uh, members of the public, um, teaching staff, members, employees, please be mindful that public comment is now over. Um, please do not disrupt the meeting. Thank you so much. So we're, we're competing with different um, industries and we have to kind of shift our thinking and that's what we're doing. Um, Mr. Sanchez and I have come up with some strategies and we're going to try to implement them. Um, but we are trying our best to address them. We are doing everything that we can. We're poaching, we're calling other districts, calling different people to kind of support us. We're looking at universities to kind of support us, NJCU, Fairleigh Dickinson. These are the things that we're trying to do. But again, we have to shift our focus and just take some time and um, see where we are. We have looked at different avenues. We looked at monies. We looked at uh, different resources, but we're trying our best. Um, just please be patient with us. Thank you. Again, excuse me, ma'am, can you please stop disrupting the board meeting? The public comment period is over. Thank you. Okay, ma'am, with, with all due respect, the board vice president just commented about the will and the intent of the board administration to respond to the questions and comments to the extent appropriate pursuant to the law. There are matters of personnel and other matters that are confidential. Again, whether you like or do not like the answer, the public comment period is over. Please stop disrupting the meeting. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like me else to address? Uh, I, I think that, that may be, don't go far. Okay. But I think that that may be all from you. So, um, Mr. Sanchez, the other two from that segment is um, preparing for the succession planning for um, Fairmount and um, programs for lost learning, which may end up being missed. Sure. So, I mean, as far as the, the succession for the Fairmont School principal, um, we, you know, once we accepted, um, you know, Principal Ashton Loeb's resignation, we did post for the position. Um, you know, clearly, you know, we're going to, we're screening our candidates. To, to be quite frank, um, you know, we want to make sure that we get an excellent pool of candidates to even screen from in, initially. So initially, um, you know, we had limited number of applicants. Um, we don't want to just, you know, interview from a pool of five. We want to make sure that we get the best possible candidates to interview from. So um, that position has been posted, and we will be interviewing soon. Hopefully, you know, we'll be hiring somebody in November. That's the goal. But, you know, again, we, we want to make sure that we do it with fidelity. As far as um, um, academic programs that, you know, we're, we're offering, I don't know if, uh, you know, Ms. Parchman and, or uh, Dr. Kazmark here, I'm not sure if she's here, if either one of you wants to speak to um, what we're doing with uh, learning loss at the schools. having a conversation with somebody so I didn't hear the question. Sure. So it had to do with uh, the, one of the comments tonight was about, um, you know, programs for academic support and le learning loss that are happening at the schools. Okay. So our middle school program for after school is going to begin next week. That's the program that we are in conjunction with the Boys and Girls Club. It, we ran a program in August with them. It was really successful. So we have 54 middle school students scheduled to scheduled that expressed interest in that program. It'll run in conjunction with the Boys and Girls Club. So there'll be ELA and math, as well as phys ed, art, and um, STEM. So that program will expand as we gain more interest. But right now we have 54 students slated for that program. High school is looking to begin a program that's gonna be 75% math. That's through our SR2 funding for learning acceleration. So they're going to be doing 75% math, 25% ELA in conjunction with the Parent Outreach Center's Homework Help Program and the SAT program that we ran last year virtually with Method Test Prep. So they're, they're looking to post soon. 
And then our elementaries are beginning their, the conversations around their tutorial programs. There were some questions around whether some of the elementary programs could run virtually. There was some interest in, from parents in that. So hopefully those postings will come up and the programs will start in November and they can run until May. They're budgeted through the end of May with um, a break in January. But if they start later, we'll be, we won't have to take the break. Yeah. And, and, and Dr. Kadmar, could you just, just stay for a second because I might need to elaborate on my next statement. Sure. So the other thing that we did, we planned to hire um, part-time intervention teachers mm -hmm. at the elementary schools. Um, we were gonna hire you know, part-time language arts and part-time math teachers. The, unfortunately, um, the candidate pool has been very slim and we weren't able to, you know, fill those positions. That you know, there really just weren't enough candidates in the pool. Um, that being said, um, we will be looking to possibly move into a coach position. And Lauren, can you expand a little bit about what we talked about? Right. So we talked about coaches for reading and math. We're doing a pretty significant ELA English language arts rollout for the elementary schools, and the elementary schools are the ones that lack supervisor support right now. So we discussed. Um, ELA and math coaches, district ELA and math coaches for the elementary schools so that they could support some of our initiatives at that level and some coaching support to teachers. Okay, thank you. And that's going to be using you know, some of the ESSER funds that we, we were planning on using the, for the part-time intervention ARP, teachers in the first place. ARP, the ESSER 3 money. Yes. Thank you, yes. Thank you. So, um, so the ECDC staff showed up in force. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm glad Mr. Cusa gave the timeline. Um, that has ha that that is a problem. We know it is a problem. Um, again, that happened many years ago. That we have to figure out. We were in a meeting this on the 13th. It is a constant conversation trying to figure that piece out. We 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 are in conversations with um, uh, other entities trying to figure out other buildings and I mean, all those pieces um but we hear you and we we know that it is absolutely a problem now um the the conversation some some kind of um piggyback it on the ecdc folks because they also brought up as as with other hea members um dealing with our paraprofessional paraprofessionals um just so um again this is as, as this current board, I can tell you, we take full responsibility of even what's happened in the past. We inherited things. For example, our lunch um, aids were um, already at a certain price. We reinstated that price. Um, and we had the, uh, in, in our uh, committee meeting, we had the exact, I was like, oh, well, crap. The, that group makes more than this group. I mean, we, we had that um, visual because um, the way it just happened to be represented on, on our, um, uh, what do you call it? It, it had a, a lunch aid next to a, a pair of professional that made um, $20. So um, we will take that back to the, the table and look at that. Um, and um, as, as far as um, the piece uh, dealing with full-time paraprofessionals, that is something I, I'm not completely sure of the history of that, of when that happened. Um, but I can tell you from a personal perspective only, I was a teacher of severe and profound students with disabilities and I had three and I could not do anything without them. Um, so we, we, will keep, we will keep that conversation um, moving. Thank you for um, bringing that, I can promise you that I am personally an advocate for our paraprofessionals because we cannot make it through a school day without you if you're here and then. Um, so one of the questions, the, um, what is the protocol if one of our vice principal, our principals is sick and the vice principal happens to be, it's her, it's her day because they're both her, at the other school? Okay, so, so I'll begin by saying, you know, all of the elementary principals do know what the plan is. So, you know, those questions could be asked there as well, but I will answer it. Um, at, at, at all schools throughout the country, throughout New Jersey, it's not mandated to have assistant principals. So I want to be clear with that. In most of the schools in Bergen County, 
that have elementary schools with over 500 kids, they do not have elementary assistant principals. That, uh, listen, audience, please. I, I respected everybody. I asked that in respect in return. If we're, we're going to answer the questions, allow us to answer them. Thank you. So the reality is that while we're accustomed to having elementary uh, assistant principals in our district here, um, it's not required to have that. So there are some districts, even within Bergen County, that share principals between two schools, let alone not having an assistant principal. So this concept and this model can work. When we have, in our current situation right now, we have um, two schools with two principals and a shared assistant principal. Um, it's not fair to that assistant principal to be jumping back and forth whenever a principal is out. So they have a schedule and they follow that schedule. When a principal is out, if I'm gonna give an example. If Mr. Uh, James Victory is a principal at one school, I'm a principal at another school, a principal of the school at School B, and Dora is our assistant principal. If she's scheduled to be with me today and I'm out, she stays at my school. If she's scheduled to be with him today and I'm out, she stays at his school, but she's still on call for that other school. She's in the district. It's no different than a principal or an assistant principal leaving their building to go to a meeting at central office. They're on call for that school. In an emergency, believe me, it's all hands on deck. In an emergency, everybody's going to run and we're going to go to that school. I, I'll go myself if I have to. So the point is that there will always be coverage. If it so happens that the three of us are out, then at that point, obviously, we will provide coverage with one of the district administrators from within the district. But again, at two schools, if, well, if both principals are out, and the assistant principal remains, the assistant principal is on call for that other school, and they can manage to run it just like many other districts do. We can handle it. Our administrators are very capable, very competent, and I'm confident that they can handle this job. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, we did bring it to the association, and the association rejected it. So that's all I can say on that topic, because I'm not allowed to speak to on negotiations. Um, so, now Lester, I'm not actually let you guide me on this one, okay? <laughs> Usually I fight him. Um, so, <clears throat> recognizing, uh, so I hear yes, yes, and is it possible to go back to Hassa? one more time and figure out a way to um, get things moving in a direction that is helpful for the students and the teachers. I, I know, I mean, I know that you're saying they, they, that it was declined, mm -hmm. but what can our efforts be? Because I don't think we negotiate with them until maybe starting like in January. Well, that's too late. Yeah. So I would say that as a general and that's a great question, and I think it shows um, the board's um, intent to be open-minded, um, to um, you know, exhaust every effort to um, create a fair uh, environment for its employees. Um, I would just, you know, the, the the labor lawyer, the management side in me, um, I have to say that negotiations, like any communications, a two-way street, um, and so to a certain extent, the traditional labor relations one hundred and one is an offer is made. Um, the recipient of that offer can either reject it and walk away or they can make a counter offer. And so I have not heard any counter offer from the association. So I would say the ball is arguably in their court as well. Um, but to answer your question, it's, you can always entertain negotiations, um, during the pendency of a contract. It's not always a preferred method, um, but we know things come up every three to five years that might not have been thought about. And so you can do what's called a reopener and you can do that. But I would submit this for the for the record and for any board member who may not be um, as up on this, that just because it was rejected doesn't mean that it's for that person who made the offer to go back to the table and come up with something else. It sometimes requires a counter offer, which I have not heard has been made yet. So I just want to kind of put that out there. Uh, so then, um, okay, so I will, I will leave it there, but... Um, 
and, and I don't know that it would require a resolution, but I, I, I would, me personally, I would like to see that we figure out a way to open up conversations again. Yeah. And, 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 now, being, being in full disclosure, that may mean there's a counter offer is what I'm hearing you, you say. Can you uh, So, so, so how, how about uh, I would suggest that all these communications go through the superintendent yes. and not be discussed at a public board yes, meeting. Sir. But I think that the in, the intent is clear that as as always, just like it is with the HEA with the impasse we're in, just like it is with the um, support professionals that we're in impasse, um, we're always open as a board um, to reasonable um, uh, alternatives and proposals that are fair, affordable, and dare I say, sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I hope that we got the big chunks of what was asked. If we did not happen to, please feel free, I say this every time, to email me and I will work to get a more direct answer for anything that we may not have tried to cover in this um, time. So let's close out tonight with some um, brief board comments. Um, uh, Mr. Goodman, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, I'd like to, uh, it'll be very brief. I'd like to thank everyone who came out for being so passionate and addressing what's really on your mind. Uh, that's why we're here together. And then just, just to thank the, you know, Mr. Montesano, the presentation on, on World Language Department was wonderful. I always love when our students are here and they give a they give a student report. Mrs. Parchman, thank you for your report. It was I, I think this meeting was much more than optics. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so I'd like to thank Ms. Vida. Alette's story for this gift. I mean, this was so thoughtful. It was so good to see that someone thought about us this morning when we, I mean, this evening when we came. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank our World Language Department and our scholars, you know, for such amazing presentations and just listening to them and watching them present in um, a manner that is just so representative of Hackensack and our teachers and all that you guys do to raise up scholars that present in that way. Um, Victor and May Lee, I'd like to thank them for sharing the student report and just giving us highlights of what's been happening um, in their school community. And I'd also like to thank everyone that came out tonight. I'd like to thank you for voicing your opinions and sharing your stories and really just being able to share your concerns with us. What you tell us is what we know. Of course, we have a lot of documents that we receive on paper. We receive some emails from you, but it's good to hear your voices and allow us the opportunity to take in this information, communicate with each other, and come up with a plan to support you as you've asked. So thank you. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, I, uh, I've only been in the seat for about a year and a half, as have, you know, more than half of this table. And like uh, uh, Mr. Scott Vickery mentioned, we inherited a lot of stuff. The reason we ran is because, like, most of you guys, you know, uh, taught our kids, my kids, are teaching my kids. I know most of you guys. I have dinner and drinks with a lot of you guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> You can't know who you are. <laughs> um, so, so like, we, you know, why, why are there issues, 100-year issues in buildings? I ran because of that. I don't, I don't, it's astounding to me that it exists, but we're fixing it. We're doing it, and we're listening. Um, you know, like I said, we just got here. So these problems, these issues, these 9, 10, 20, 15 issues for me baffled me when I ran, and that's why I ran. So understand, like, Nobody wants to be attacked. So when I say, like, let's change the culture, we hear you. We want to listen. We want to conversate. Some of y'all want to be preachers. Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I want to listen, and I want to make a change. But we're human beings. We're here. 
Listen, I see that occasion, it's 1040, y'all are still here. And I, I, I love that and I appreciate that. And that's why I'm still here. <laughs> um, so please, uh, keep the communication lines open. We do hear you, we do want to make change, and we do go back and talk about these issues that you guys arise for. Now, I only know what my kids experience and what I experience. Now, the emails that I get from you are very far off in between. I get very few and I try to answer them when I do get them. Um, but th just understand that we are all here to try to make that difference. So please be patient and keep coming and keep and keep speaking. Change the culture though. There's no need to attack us. <laughs> we're, we're, we're dads. We're, we're moms. We're just here trying to do our best. All right. Thank you. Mr. Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, as a young man, you're taught or you're told that everything, if someone says something supportive or complimentary, and it's followed by a but, you disregard the complimentary or supportive comments made prior to that. And there is a, a dismissiveness about the seriousness about what transpired since the last meeting. I commend you, uh, Mr. Oates, you already have a job where you put your life on the line. I think it's commendable that you volunteer your time, that you are trying to make a difference in this community and that you're trying to make a better condition for your kids, your young kids that go to these schools. And it saddens me that you had to have the audacity to make critical comments at one meeting in a string of meetings that are contentious, that are filled with jeers, cheers, confrontational meetings, critical meetings. You had that audacity and the response was far outsized than it needed to be. As someone mentioned before, a coward behind a keyboard decided to weigh in. on someone's behalf. And I can say in closing that I appreciate what you do. I hope going forward from this night on, because obviously it's still continued tonight, that we treat each other, particularly people that are volunteering their time with a little kindness and respect and have some civility in these public spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oates. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Get ready for some long comments. I'm going to travel on for hours. I'm just kidding. I'll try to make it quick. Uh, Mr. Vice President, good job tonight, Mr. Vice President. I think you did a great job, buddy. Good job, good job. Okay. Um, from the uh, last meeting, appreciate the comments on the threat. I think it's obvious that we're not going to be intimidated. We're going to stay here and fight. We don't scratch our head unless it itches. We don't dance unless we hear music. We're not going to be intimidated. Um, but yeah, that, that was, I think that was from Remember the Titans, if there's any movie heads out there. Yeah, so we, um, I feel yucky. I feel yucky. I feel very yucky. I don't like the way things are. It just feels very, something feels very uncomfortable. But I feel like tonight, this may be weird, I don't know, it, but it was like a spark with all the passion and all the energy that, that was brought here tonight is a good thing and it means change. And I, for one, I think that we got to do better. We have to do better collectively. That's on our side. You guys are working your tails off. I said last year, um, I said last year that, it, you know, during the COVID, it was going to be the hardest few months of our lives. 
and that we're going to have to bring our A game every step of the way. And I kept saying it was our job to put you in the best position to succeed. And I don't know if we're doing that. I don't know if we're doing that. And I think that we have to do some introspection. Now, again, it's a balance of what this and that and contracts and all this stuff. But I just feel very yucky. And it, it's a, it's a, we're a family, right? We spoke before about a family. And if one, one of our family is hurting for reasons that we can fix and work on and work together, what the hell are we doing? Like, we are here to fix this for our kids, our community, our town. This is our city. There's nobody else coming in to save it. I said that already. So we got we to figure this thing out. We got to figure this thing out. And I want to say uh, congratulations to all the sports teams, the playoff push. Awesome about the middle school starting sports. The heartbeat. Get the heartbeat going here. Get the heartbeat. Again, it's going to take like um, 5,335 as our students. But that doesn't mean they're the only ones in our family. And we got we got to watch out for each other. And we got to do what we can to help each other. This is a special place. You've seen it with the, the world language presentation. You've seen it with Ms. Parchman Oates and Ms. Messina's presentations. There's a lot going on here to be proud of. There is a lot going on to be proud of. Let me just end by saying, like, in softball and baseball, we go, and whenever we break down before a game or after a game or even, more often than not, a rallying cry in between innings, right? Right, Coach, back there. One, two, three, comments, four, five, six, family. I didn't make that up. That came from Coach Brad Allen uh, from the middle school. He does that. He started that. When I started coaching with him five, six, seven years ago, that was his thing, and I, I took it, and we do it. But one, two, three, comments, four, five, six, family, and we all yell it, and we are a family. And just understand that we do hear you. I'm sorry I'm talking on my back to you guys. I'm sorry about that. I can get up and start pacing. I don't know. I don't. Uh, but just understand that we are going to work this thing through. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to figure this out. Special kids in this district. And we understand you guys are working your tails off. And understand that we see it. Thank you. Good job tonight, guys. Good job, everybody. So, Go comments. Thank you. So um, I will be very brief, hopefully briefer. Um, so I, I really, watching the world language students was just fantastic. They all were absolutely amazing. I'll tell you, one of those young men needs to be like a talk show host or uh, I think there's maybe an Italian club, but they really all did an amazing job and it shows how um, even when we have hard times in this district, we are still producing great work. Um, and that is much appreciated. I heard that there's an outdoor pep rally coming up at some point. I want to be invited to that because at the top 20 dinner, that's what the number one memory was, these pep rallies. So I want to be able to come and experience it. Um, I want to, a, a couple comments were made, you know, because I do desperately want Miss West to like me at some point. I am not going to use the, the the words of the racket game and um but what i will say is what i want you what what i want everybody to to, to take pride in the things that are happening because we do i'll tell you one of my my baby could not go to school for four months because of a broken leg because we are 30 years behind that happened at night are you getting in the Um, but Miss West, 
what, what I want the, what I want the collective group to understand, um, and I know that y'all know this, but I want us to figure out a way to take pride in all the things that are going because, like the elevators, group that was in 1991. It's not just that we, you know, it's not. I mean, because we, it's about employment. Our our teachers who may have mobility issues. It's about it's a moral obligation. It's not something that we should just do because you know, it is a moral obligation. Um, and we're 30 years behind. But I want to say all these projects that are happening, I just want everybody to be on the same page that those projects have to happen. So two, my wife says all the time, two things can be true. And although we are maybe having these issues over here, we still are bound by New Jersey state law and federal law to be spending certain amounts of money in a certain bucket of money that can't go towards anything but improvement. So I want us to take collectively take pride. Um, I get the overuse of the, the, the thing, <laughs> but I understand, I understand the sentiment, but I want us to take <laughs> pride in what is happening. Um, I'm going to say the same with um, Mikey of, or Mr. Oates about the middle school sports. That's fantastic, y'all. That's, that's where it all starts when it comes to our high school sports. And that's like, we're, we're, we're finally, you know, we're getting there. Um, and, and, um, and, I, and, and I will give a shout out to Dr. Galliano for, for working to make that happen. Um, I know one of my personal children is starting cross country. We're hoping he burns off as much energy as possible tomorrow. <laughs> so um, um, thank you. Um, let me just say um, that, that um, uh, Mr. Powell was mandated to work tonight and that he, he asked me to, to share with you that he, he was, didn't have a choice, um, but that, that, that is where he is. Um, and now I don't want you all to cuss me out, but I would like for us to go back into closed session just for a few minutes, I promise, <laughs> for just a few minutes, because um, I want us, while while their comments are fresh on in our minds and what's going on, and it just so happens that negotiations, our timelines are kind of wonky with um, when our next board meeting is, so I want us to make sure that we have everything um, fresh in our minds. So if y'all would... In, do we have to do a, a thing for that? Yeah, so Mr. Vice President, the motion would be to go into closed executive session to discuss uh, matters of negotiations, specifically with the HEA and the HAOP, um, and as well as other bargaining units in the district. Minutes will be taken and released to the public if and when the need for confidentiality no longer exists, and action may be taken by the board when it reconvenes the public session. Thank you. I, I move what he said. <laughs> <laughs> A second by. No, 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 no. No. I have a question. I always say that, but yes. It, it's just this. So they should wait. Well, they, they have an option to wait, um, but it reserves the right for the board to take action if they uh, desire to. All right. So we're going back into closed session. Oh, for us. Uh, uh, you said you can take a number. I don't know. I'm, doing, I'm just raising my hand. I don't did know. it. All right. <laughs> Um, and um, the rest of you, I know you have to be at work in the morning, so um, you can wait for us to come out. I don't know that we'll have anything to say, or we'll see you next time. Because we don't really adjourn, right? <laughs>